If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1, All Hallows' Eve at Godric's Hollow On the 31st of October, 1981, All Hallows' Eve cast its magical aura over the wizarding world, but at the Potter residence in Godric's Hollow, a different atmosphere prevailed. The air was thick with tension, a stark contrast to the usual festivities of the night. Inside, Fleamont and Euphemia Potter were caring for their grandsons, Harry and Charles Potter, under the shroud of worry and fear. Harry Potter, at the tender age of four, had striking green eyes, a mirror of his mother Lily's. His eyes sparkled with a curious intelligence, while his untamed black hair refused to be tamed, much like his adventurous spirit. His younger brother, Charles, barely over a year old, bore a striking resemblance to their father, James, but with the same green eyes as his mother. Charles was born on July 31, 1980, during a scary time. Harry was born earlier, on October 12, 1977, right after his parents finished school at Hogwarts.1. Unlike Charles, Harry's early years were shaped under the caring eyes of Fleamont and Euphemia. This upbringing fostered a deep, unbreakable bond between Harry and his grandparents, nurtured through endless stories, shared laughter, and their constant, comforting presence. This close connection stood in stark contrast to the fleeting and rare visits from his parents, James and Lily, who were deeply entrenched in the fight against Voldemort as key members of the Order of the Phoenix. The night's tension was heightened by the absence of James and Lily, who were out in a desperate search for their friend, Peter Pettigrew. Peter's sudden disappearance had sent ripples of concern through the Order, especially since he was the entrusted secret keeper of their home under the Fidelio's charm. Euphemia didn't like that the first instinct of her son was not to move to a safer place but to search for Peter and make sure that he was safe. Euphemia, whose wisdom was as vast as her age, blamed this as a result of Dumbledore's influence over her son. She distrusted Dumbledore ever since James stopped listening to her and started having unwavering faith in the Order of the Phoenix and Dumbledore. Euphemia viewed Dumbledore's strategies, especially his insistence on non-lethal methods and second chances even for the most dangerous of enemies as a dangerous naivety that cost the lives of many innocent witches and wizards over the course of this war. Her skepticism about Dumbledore only grew with the recent emergence of a prophecy, allegedly involving her grandson Charles and the dark wizard Voldemort. The circumstances surrounding the prophecy its vague wording, the reputation of the seer who uttered it, and the suspiciously convenient eavesdropping by a Death Eater seemed too contrived, almost as if being manipulated by unseen, calculating hands. The fact that Dumbledore was involved in all these made her doubt his motives. In the midst of these swirling concerns, Euphemia found solace in the company of her grandsons. Her voice, usually a beacon of strength and resolve, softened as she addressed Harry. Would you like to hear about the bravest wizard your granddad and I ever knew? She asked, a gentle smile gracing her features. Harry's eyes, always so full of life and curiosity, lit up. Yes, Grandma. The one who tamed a dragon. He asked, his voice brimming with youthful eagerness. That very one, Euphemia replied, her eyes twinkling as they reflected memories from a time long past. There was an undeniable uniqueness to Harry, evident even at his young age. His questions were thoughtful, his demeanor unusually serene for a child. While others his age succumbed to bouts of tantrums or lost themselves in childish play, Harry was different. He would sit quietly, his eyes wide and attentive, absorbing every tale every nugget of wisdom his grandparents shared. It was as if he was not just hearing the stories, but living them, learning from them a trait that set him apart in a world where the line between the ordinary and the extraordinary was often blurred. Harry Potter's precocious maturity, a trait that set him apart from other children his age, had an unusual origin, a series of nightly dreams. Initially, these dreams were sporadic and fragmented, like pieces of a puzzle scattered in the recesses of his mind. However, as time passed, they began to form a more coherent narrative. In these dreams, Harry found himself inhabiting the life of a muggle or a person without magic, immersed in a world of towering structures and cacophonous machines. This era, illuminated by electric lights and filled with the hum of computers and the roar of automobiles, was in stark contrast to the magical realm he lived by day. Yet, despite the technological wonders that surrounded him, the muggle at the center of Harry's dreams was weighed down by a heart brimming with unrealized aspirations. These nocturnal journeys were more than mere dreams to Harry, they were windows into experiences and emotions far beyond his tender years. He kept these visions to himself, fearing they might cause undue worry to his already burdened family. But dreams, as passing as they may seem, have a profound way of shaping reality. The experiences, regrets, 
and hopes of the figure in Harry's dreams began to mold his worldview. Driven by the desire to learn from another's past mistakes, Harry found himself giving up the trivial concerns of childhood. Instead, he developed an insatiable thirst for knowledge and a depth of understanding that was highly unusual for someone of his age. This newfound wisdom, gleaned from his dreams, began to intertwine with the magical stories his grandparents shared. Through this unique blend of otherworldly experiences and enchanting tales, Harry was becoming a young sage, understanding complexities that eluded his peers. As Euphemia wove the tale of the wizard who tamed a dragon, Harry listened with rapt attention. His mind skillfully merged the insights from his dreams with the magical narrative, transforming him from a mere child into a repository of wisdom, his perspective enriched by experiences spanning beyond his years. That night, the Potter household, typically a bastion of joy and safety, was shrouded in an air of unease. Euphemia's stories, usually a source of delight, now served as a shield against the ominous feelings that lingered in the air. Flemont, a man of few words, wore an expression of deep concern. He felt something bad might happen soon. Harry felt something wrong with the mood of his grandparents but did not think much of it as during these times of war most of the days were like this. Meanwhile, young Charles, blissfully unaware of the gravity of the situation, played contentedly. Euphemia's gaze often drifted towards her grandsons, her thoughts reaching out to James and Lily, enveloped in a silent prayer for their safe return. In this house, under the shadow of impending darkness, a new chapter was unfolding. It was the beginning of the story of Harry Potter, the boy prophesied to defeat the Dark Lord. A tale that, in time, would be recounted for generations to come, weaving its way into the tapestry of wizarding lore. Chapter 2, A Night of Courage and Sacrifice As the clock ominously ticked closer to midnight in the Potter household, a palpable sense of dread permeated the air. Fleamont Potter, a wizard of considerable prowess who once stood firm against many dark wizards, felt a chilling disturbance. The protective wards he had meticulously woven around his son's residence, a supplementary safeguard to the Fidelio's charm, were being attacked by an unknown force. With the instincts of a seasoned warrior, Fleamont sensed the activation of the anti-apparition wards, an ominous sign of impending danger. His hand instinctively reached for his wand, a steadfast companion through countless battles. Euphemia, take the boys upstairs, Fleamont commanded, his voice resonating with an authoritative calmness. I'll confront the intruder. Euphemia, ever aware of the stakes at play, quickly ushered Harry and Charles to the safety of their room. Meanwhile, Fleamont steeled himself for the confrontation, his grip on his wand unyielding. In the children's sanctuary, Euphemia, with practiced hands, began etching protective runes around Charles's cradle. Haunted by a premonition of this very night, she had painstakingly researched ancient magics that would aid her in defeating the dark wizard Voldemort. Her efforts had been fruitful and she had unearthed a forgotten sacrificial ritual a desperate measure, but one that held a glimmer of hope against the dark tide they faced. Turning to Harry, she regarded him with a mixture of maternal affection and sorrowful resignation. Having been more of a mother to him than Lily, who was preoccupied with the war, her bond with Harry was profound. Harry, my brave boy, you must be strong now. Remember to protect Charles, as we have always protected you, she implored her voice imbued with a blend of motherly love and the resolve of a warrior. Harry, young but unusually perceptive, understood the gravity of her words. A silent nod was his vow, a promise of protection and bravery beyond his years. Downstairs, the clash between Fleamont and the intruder, none other than Voldemort himself, erupted into a violent maelstrom of magic. Voldemort, cold and calculating, offered a chilling proposition. Give me the child, Fleamont, Voldemort hissed menacingly. I have no quarrel with you or your wife. It's the boy I seek. But Fleamont, unyielding and resolute, stood his ground. You shall not lay a finger on my grandson, you vile creature, he declared, his voice a defiant roar amidst the swirling chaos of spells. The ensuing duel was a testament to Fleamont's indomitable spirit and Voldemort's merciless pursuit of his dark agenda. Despite his valiant efforts, Fleamont found himself at a tactical disadvantage battling not just for his own life but also to protect the house from collapsing in the fight and hurting his grandchildren. In the children's room, Euphemia completed the runic circle, its ancient symbols glowing with a faint, ethereal light. She then draped Harry with the Potter family's ancient invisibility cloak, positioning him near Charles's cradle. Her heart was heavy with the knowledge of what was to come, the weight of sacrifice pressing upon her soul. Harry, remember to always believe in yourself, to be courageous, and to stand for what is right. Our love for you will be your shield, 
forever enduring in your heart, she whispered, her voice a haunting melody of comfort and finality. While she waited Euphemia's thoughts lingered on the uncertain futures of Harry and Charles. If her sacrifice succeeded in thwarting Voldemort, Charles would likely be hailed as a miraculous survivor of the death curse, potentially attracting unwanted fame and attention. She hoped that such fame would not alter his character detrimentally. Euphemia's deepest wish was for the night's harrowing events to remain shrouded in secrecy, allowing Charles a chance at a normal life. Her worry for Harry, however, cut a different, yet equally deep, swath in her heart. Euphemia and Fleamont had become Harry's sanctuary, his primary haven of love and care, a stark contrast to the distant and sporadic presence of his parents, James and Lily. The prospect of her absence, the void it would create in Harry's life, filled her with an aching dread. She feared it might further estrange Harry from his family, especially if Charles became the center of attention in the aftermath of the night's events. A loud crash from below shattered the eerie silence, jolting Euphemia into action. Cloaked in a mantle of determination, she positioned herself at the doorway, a guardian poised to face the unknown. When Voldemort entered, his presence was as chilling as the darkness he wielded. Euphemia stood her ground, a formidable figure of unwavering courage in front of her grandsons. Disregarding Voldemort's demands to step aside, she faced him with a courage that was both fierce and tragic. The green killing curse he unleashed upon her marked the end of her stand but ignited the runic protective magic she had prepared. Under the invisibility cloak, Harry witnessed everything, his eyes filled with tears. However, he didn't make a sound in fear and, honoring his grandmother's last wish, moved in front of his brother to protect him. Despite his fear, Harry stood steadfast in front of his brother, prepared to do whatever it took to keep him safe. Voldemort approached the cradle, his gaze fixed on Charles, the child he believed was prophesied to destroy him. Harry under the cloak now stood inches from him but remained hidden under the magic of the invisibility cloak. Charles had stopped crying, too young to understand the events unfolding around him. Voldemort couldn't understand how this child, who looked nothing special and possessed just above average magical power, could ever pose a threat to him. Nevertheless, driven by paranoia and the desire to thwart fate, Voldemort was resolved to eliminate what he perceived as a potential threat. Disappointing, Voldemort sneered, his voice dripping with disdain as he raised his wand. I expected more from a child prophesied to be my end. But it matters not. Your death will ensure no one stands in my way. His face twisted into a cruel smile as he prepared to unleash his fatal curse, Avada Kedavra. Just then, Unseen by Voldemort, the runes encircling Charles's cradle sprang to life, glowing with an ethereal light. Euphemia Potter's ultimate sacrifice had activated the Dome of Magical Protection, enveloping both Harry and Charles in its unseen embrace. As Voldemort released the deadly killing curse, it met the invisible magical barrier, resulting in a burst of brilliant white light. Under the cloak, Harry, too, began to emit a similar radiant glow. His innate magic, unbeknownst to him, mingled with the protective dome, fortifying it against the dark spell. As Voldemort watched in shock, the barrier not only withstood his curse but intensified in brilliance. The Dome of Magic then retaliated with a golden counter spell that surged directly towards Voldemort. Striking him squarely in the chest, the spell reduced Voldemort to ashes within moments, his clothes collapsing to the floor. Yet, the spell, intended to obliterate Voldemort entirely, was impeded by a hidden anchor to the mortal world Voldemort's horcruxes. And from Voldemort's ashes, two sinister black wisps emerged one latching onto Harry's forehead, the other manifesting as a wraith-like entity. This wraith, a weakened remnant of Voldemort, lunged desperately towards Charles. However, Harry, in his unconscious state, again emitted a pulsating white light that repelled the wraith, forcing it to flee into the night. Thus, the ruins of the Potter House bore witness to a profound change in the wizarding world. A night that was meant to herald darkness instead became the turning point in a war against evil, laying the foundation for a story that would be etched in wizarding history forever. Chapter 3, The Awakening of Memories In the grim aftermath of that fateful night, the Potter House stood in shambles, a solemn testament to the tragedy that had unfolded. Amidst the ruins, Harry and Charles, the sole survivors, lay unharmed, their innocence a stark contrast to the devastation surrounding them. The stillness of the night was abruptly broken by a subtle, scurrying sound. A rat, with beady, calculating eyes, crept into the room through a crack in the wall. In the blink of an eye, the rat transformed, revealing its true form, Peter Pettigrew. Peter's eyes darted across the room, absorbing the surreal scene the unscathed children and the remnants of the Dark Lord's visit, 
a dark cloak and the Dark Lord's wand lying on the ground. Pettigrew's face twisted in panic. As a traitor to the Potters and now witness to his master's apparent downfall, he found himself in a precarious position. He had already betrayed the Potters, putting him at odds with the light side. Now, with his master apparently killed, he realized he was also in danger from the dark side. Fear for his own life overrode any other concerns. Snatching up Voldemort's wand, he transformed back into his animagus form of a rat quickly. He didn't even consider doing anything to the children, whatever force had vanquished the Dark Lord was not something he wanted to reckon with. His tiny rat heart pounding with fear, Petty grew scurried out of the room and disappeared into the night, desperate to save his own skin. Meanwhile, Harry, lying amidst the rubble of what was once his home, the invisibility cloak thrown away in the aftermath, and with tears in his eyes, felt something strange happening within his mind. It was as though a hidden vault in his mind had been unlocked, releasing a deluge of memories that felt both foreign and intimately familiar. These memories, vivid and extensive, connected all the fragmented nightly dreams he had experienced in the past, weaving them into a coherent narrative. As he lay unconscious, his mind embarked on an extraordinary journey through the life of a muggle in a world vastly different from his own. In this mental journey, Harry found himself living through key experiences of this muggle's life, skipping over the personal and intimate details like birth, family dynamics and romantic relationships. Instead, the memories focused on the acquisition of knowledge and life experiences. He attended school, where he learned mathematics and science, subjects alien yet fascinating to him. He then progressed to university, delving deeper into the world of academia. After university, the memories shifted to an ordinary 9-to-5 job, portraying a routine yet insightful glimpse into a mundane adult life. These memories, however, abruptly ended when the muggle reached the age of 23, leaving a sense of unfinished business. Among the most captivating elements of these memories was the muggle's deep fascination with the Harry Potter book series. This interest led to an exploration of fan fiction, a realm where the canonical boundaries of the original story were creatively reimagined. Harry was captivated by the creativity and diversity of these fan fictions, which presented alternate realities and possibilities for characters he felt a strange kinship with. Absorbing these memories and experiences, Harry could feel the emotions of that man as if they were his own. He could feel the man's joys, sorrows, and fears. Harry soon deduced that these memories were from his past life. He had for some reason retained his past life memories and they were getting unlocked through his nightly dreams. But, due to this night's turmoil, the memories that were supposed to unlock slowly as he grew up, got released prematurely. Harry Potter, the three-year-old boy who had just lost his grandparents, was now also a 23-year-old man from another world, reincarnated into the Harry Potter universe. However, the mental journey he had gone through did not contain any personal details, like he did not know his name in his past life or remember his parents in his last life. This ensured Harry did not have any attachment to his past identity. Harry felt the joys, sorrows and fears of his past life as if they were his own, yet he retained his identity as Harry Potter. His love for his current grandparents, his distant parents, and his younger brother Charles remained unaltered. He was still Harry Potter, yet he was now imbued with knowledge and wisdom that spanned beyond his young years. In this unique state of being, Harry silently vowed to use his newfound knowledge to combat the dark forces that had shattered his family. He would grow into a wizard who would honor the legacy of Fleamont and Euphemia, a beacon of strength in a world shadowed by darkness. From the memories of the Harry Potter books and fanfiction he had absorbed, Harry realized he was reborn into the very universe he had once read about. The world he knew was the Harry Potter universe, and he was its titular character. He understood that he had been born into an alternate reality, where his brother Charles would be hailed as the boy who lived. From the things he knew about the prophecy's wordings, he could not be the boy who lived since he was not born on July 31st like his brother. However, this did not bother him. He did not care about the title or the status that came along with the title. All he wanted to do was become the strongest wizard in the world and restore the status of the Potter family in the wizarding world, making his grandparents proud. As Harry drifted deeper into sleep, his thoughts did not go to the dormant fragment of Voldemort's soul nestled within him. Harry, who had read about his fictional counterpart's experiences in the books, was aware of this dark fragment yet did not feel any sense of urgency, knowing that the literary Harry had lived with it for 17 years without any immediate harm. This night had indeed marked the beginning of a new epoch in Harry Potter's life. He was a child in body, but within him resided the mind and memories of an adult. His path was set to leave an indelible mark on the magical world, a journey that would intertwine the threads of fate, magic, and an extraordinary destiny. 
Chapter 4, The Duel Within the Mind As Harry regained consciousness, he found himself not in the familiar surroundings of his home but in an endless, stark white expanse. This surreal landscape was in sharp contrast to the chaos he had left behind. A sense of deja vu enveloped him, as this place uncannily resembled the setting from the final book of the Harry Potter series, where Harry met Dumbledore after Voldemort's attack. A chilling thought crossed his mind, was he on the other side, having succumbed to the night's events? In the distance, a figure that Harry recognized all too well stood Voldemort. This version of Voldemort, however, seemed different, less malevolent, yet undeniably sinister. His cold, red eyes locked onto Harry's, and with a predatory grace, he closed the distance between them. Harry prepared to confront him. Ah, so this is where I've ended up, Voldemort mused aloud. In the mind of a mere child. A sinister smirk played on his lips. And given the circumstances of this night, I deduce that I'm not the full Voldemort but a mere fragment, a shard of my soul split off during the bizarre events of tonight and latched onto you. Fixing his gaze on Harry, Voldemort said you must be the older Potter boy. I'm uncertain how I ended up within you. Though you're not the prophesied one, you'll suffice. Once I annihilate you here, I can take over your body and resurrect stronger than ever. Understanding the danger he faced, Harry knew he couldn't let Voldemort prevail. Harry's mind started racing, trying to find ways to get out of this predicament. He tried to conjure various muggle weapons like guns from his past life that could help him defeat Voldemort through his thoughts but failed. He also failed to summon other weapons and even magical wands from his memories. After many failed attempts, it was only when he imagined the familiar phoenix feather wand from the Harry Potter stories that he felt a wand appear in his hand and a surge of power course through him. Voldemort's smirk faded slightly, replaced by a look of genuine surprise. Oh, young Potter, you amuse me. I am surprised you even know how to hold a wand properly. But, do you think a mere wand can save you? He taunted. Harry replied with a confidence that belied his years, you see. Voldy. This is my domain. Here, you cannot defeat me. A child, Voldemort sneered. You think you can defeat me? I've vanquished the greatest of wizards. Your end is inevitable. Once your soul is crushed, I shall inhabit your shell. Imagine the world's reaction when someone from the Potter family becomes a Dark Lord. The duel began. Harry, drawing help from his grandmother's stories he loved, conjured spells far beyond the capacity of a toddler. Diffindo. He cried out, surprising Voldemort with the cutting curse. Harry himself was equally surprised and excited that the spell had worked. He felt a thrill he had never known, he was dueling with the most feared Dark Lord and holding his own. As the battle raged on, Harry found himself learning and adapting. He was having fun, a stark contrast to the dark intentions of his opponent. Voldemort, initially toying with Harry as if he were mere prey, gradually increased his efforts as he realized the child was no ordinary opponent. Even though he felt significantly weaker due to being a mere soul shard, he couldn't fathom his inability to kill an inexperienced child who, inexplicably, could wield magic so effectively. The duel escalated, spells flying back and forth like a deadly dance. Harry, growing more confident and fluid in his movements, was a stark contrast to the increasingly frustrated Dark Lord. In a fit of rage, Voldemort, maddened by his inability to kill the boy, cast his defining spell, Avada Kedavra. Harry, seeing the green spell coming towards him, remembered the cliché scene from the books and instinctively cast Expelliarmus. Just like in Harry's fourth year in the original timeline, a tug-of-war between the spells ensued. It went on for a long time, and neither was willing to give up. Give up, boy. You cannot defeat the greatest Dark Lord of all time, Voldemort. Hissed the Dark Lord, his voice laced with venom. Harry, undeterred, retorted, remember this defeat on your journey to hell, Voldemort, or should I say Tom Marvolo Riddle. Hearing his true name uttered, Voldemort faltered, his focus wavering momentarily. Harry seized this opportunity, pushing the spell back with all his might. Voldemort's efforts to regain control proved futile. As the rebounding curse struck Voldemort, he screamed in disbelief, Nu! How could I lose to a child? His form began to disintegrate, his existence within Harry's mind crumbling away. In the wake of his monumental victory over the fragment of Voldemort's soul, Harry felt an internal transformation. The energy of the vanquished soul shard was absorbed into his being, fortifying his soul. Contrary to his expectations, influenced by fanfiction narratives, he acquired no memories of Voldemort. Yet, 
this did not dampen his spirits. He had faced and conquered a part of the most feared dark wizard in history, marking his first triumphant battle in this world. The exhilaration of this victory, his inaugural encounter with combat in the wizarding realm, was heady and empowering. Emboldened by this experience and the knowledge from his past life, Harry felt a resolute determination solidifying within him. He recognized the daunting path ahead, littered with challenges and uncertainties. Yet, with this newfound resolve, he was ready to embark on this journey. His aim was clear, to prepare, to learn, and to grow into a formidable wizard. The trials that lay ahead would be arduous, but Harry was determined to face them with unwavering courage and strength. As this internal resolution took hold, the scene shifted back to the physical world. In the ruins of the Potter House, where Harry's young body lay in an unconscious state, a sinister black sludge oozed from his scar. This dark residue, the last vestige of Voldemort's corrupting influence, slowly evaporated into the night, leaving no trace. In a moment of magical purification, a brilliant white light enveloped Harry, healing his scar. The magic within him acted as a purging force, cleansing him of the last remnants of the Dark Lord's presence. The once prominent lightning-shaped scar on his forehead, a stark reminder of that fateful night, now faded completely. As Harry lay there, his small form still and serene, the invisibility cloak that had shielded him earlier now lay crumpled beside him. The house, which once rang with the laughter of a family, stood wounded and silent, its walls echoing the night's grim battle. Outside, the neighborhood slumbered on, blissfully unaware of the profound struggle that had unfolded in the quiet house at the end of the lane. Chapter 5, Aftermath and Revelations In the aftermath of the harrowing night, the once vibrant Potter residence stood as a somber relic, its walls echoing the terror and bravery that had unfolded within. The once joyful home now lay in ruins, its very essence altered by the night's events. The remnants of powerful spells lingered in the air, invisible protectors of the home's tragic secrets, unbeknownst to the world beyond. The stillness of the night was abruptly shattered by the sharp cracks of apparition. A group of familiar faces, led by James and Lily Potter, Sirius Black, and accompanied by members of the Order of the Phoenix, and the Venerable Albus Dumbledore, materialized outside the house. Their expressions, a complex tapestry of dread and resolve, spoke volumes of the gravity of the situation they feared to face. Upon entering the devastated dwelling, James was immediately confronted with the grim reality of his loss. His father, Fleamont, lay motionless, his final stand etched into the very ruins that surrounded him. The sight pierced James's heart with a grief so profound, it rendered him momentarily speechless. The loss of his father, once a pillar of strength and courage, left James reeling in a torrent of sorrow and disbelief. Meanwhile, propelled by a mother's instinctive urgency, Lily ascended the stairs to the nursery. Her steps, heavy with a mix of fear and determination, echoed through the desolate corridors. Her heart raced with dread, each beat amplifying her fear for her sons. Lily, be careful. James's voice followed her, a blend of his own anguish for his father and anxiety for his wife and children. As Lily entered the nursery, she was met with a heart-wrenching scene. Euphemia Potter lay still, her final act of sacrifice evident in her peaceful demeanor. Lily's eyes, blurred with tears, moved swiftly to the cradle. A whisper escaped her lips, a fragile thread of hope, as she approached her sons. Charles, Harry, she murmured, her voice trembling with apprehension. Her heart, which had been pounding in trepidation, experienced a tumult of emotions when she saw them, both unharmed, sleeping peacefully. She gently lifted Charles, cradling him in her arms. The sight of a small scar on his forehead briefly puzzled her, but the overwhelming relief of finding him safe calmed her anxious heart. Turning her attention to Harry, lying beside the crib under the rumpled cloak, she noted with relief that he bore no marks or scars. Unknown to her, magic had completely healed his mark of a lightning-shaped scar, leaving no visible trace of the night's ordeal. Despite the horrors they had faced, her children were safe, a fact that brought a cascade of relief and gratitude. Oh, my loves, Lily whispered, her voice a mixture of tears and relief as she held her sons close to her heart. The nightmare of the night slowly gave way to the realization that her family, though profoundly changed, had survived the darkest of times. In the dimly lit nursery, now a tableau of sorrow and relief, the arrival of James, Lily, Sirius, and Dumbledore, along with other members of the Order, cast a somber shadow over the room. Sirius Black, his deep connection with the Potter family evident, shared in the collective grief, his eyes reflecting the profound loss that enveloped the space. Albus Dumbledore, his countenance as enigmatic as ever, moved through the room with a quiet, deliberate grace. 
his fingers lightly traced the remnants of Euphemia's runic circle, sensing the residual power of her sacrificial magic. His gaze, both ancient and insightful, lingered on the two young boys, Harry and Charles, lying peacefully amidst the ruins of their once joyful home. As Dumbledore leaned in to examine the children, his eyes, usually twinkling with hidden knowledge, were now searching, perhaps seeking confirmation of the cryptic prophecy. This was Dumbledore's first close observation of Harry, Fleamont's cautious approach had kept Harry at a safe distance, a decision Dumbledore had respected, given Harry's birth date did not align with the prophecy's specifics. Upon examining Harry, Dumbledore noted the absence of any dark magic or remarkable marks and felt Harry's magical reserves to be surprisingly low, unaware that it was a temporary effect of the night's struggles. This observation led Dumbledore to completely dismiss the likelihood of Harry being the child foretold in the prophecy. Charles, however, presented a different scenario. Dumbledore observed good magical reserves, though not at a prodigious level, and a cut on his forehead in the shape of a wand, which seemed to be saturated with dark magic. Unbeknownst to Dumbledore, this mark was an accidental consequence of the chaotic events and not a result of Voldemort's attack, yet it captured his attention as a possible indicator of the prophecy's fulfillment. The wand-shaped cut could be seen as Voldemort marking Charles as his equal for the final confrontation in the future. Dumbledore straightened up and turned to James and Lily, his expression grave but certain. James, Lily, Dumbledore began, his voice steady and imbued with a deep, resonant authority, it appears that Charles is the child mentioned in the prophecy. From what I can conclude, Voldemort has been defeated tonight by Charles, but not completely. He still remains alive in some form. I fear he will return in the future and when he does, Charles will have to face him again. He concluded, it appears that Charles has defeated Voldemort, with magic unknown to me as it said in the prophecy. I will have to research into it to know more. Dumbledore's conclusion, albeit partially inaccurate, was guided by his interpretation of the prophecy and the visible evidence before him. He omitted mentioning Euphemia's role, choosing instead a narrative that supported his deduction. The revelation sent a wave of shock and fear through James and Lily. The thought of their infant son destined to face such darkness again was unbearable. Lily's voice quivered as she sought clarity, but Albus, hasn't the prophecy been fulfilled today with Charles's actions? Must he face Voldemort again? Can't someone else face Voldemort when he returns? James, equally shaken, suggested that Harry, being present during the attack and the elder brother, might also fit the prophecy's criteria. He harbored hope that Harry, with more time to learn and grow, could have a better chance than Charles to ultimately defeat Voldemort. Dumbledore shook his head gently, his eyes momentarily clouding with an emotion hard to place. The prophecy spoke of a child whom Voldemort would mark as his equal, he replied softly. See here, he gestured towards Charles's scar, which was vivid and pulsating with a dark aura. He then turned his gaze towards Harry, and Harry bears no such mark, he continued, the prophecy spoke of a child marked by Voldemort as his equal, and here we see the evidence. Tonight, Charles has been marked. The prophecy's fulfillment requires a future confrontation. Before further discussion could ensue, the sound of apparition outside signaled the arrival of more people. Dumbledore's attention shifted towards the noise, his demeanor changing to one of cautious readiness. It appears we have more company he remarked, the seriousness of their conversation momentarily put aside as they prepared to face the new arrivals. Chapter 6, Aurors The arrivals to the Potter residence, a blend of ministry officials and Aurors, presented a stark contrast to the disarray and grief that permeated the air. Their stern expressions and official robes added a layer of formality to the tragedy at hand. Among them, dark cloaked figures, likely unspeakables from the Department of Mysteries, moved with an enigmatic aura their presence adding a layer of mystery to the grim scene. The Order of the Phoenix members, who had been tending to the Potters, swiftly briefed the newcomers on the situation, while Dumbledore, James, and Lily remained in the nursery, a haven of bittersweet relief amidst the chaos. Leading the group of Aurors was Barty Crouch Sr., his demeanor as head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement exuding a stringent authority. Despite his habitual stoicism, the tragedy reflected in his eyes betrayed his inner distress. The scene before him, a testament to both loss and miraculous survival, seemed to momentarily soften his usually rigid posture. Upon encountering the bodies of Fleamont and Euphemia, the group paid their respects, their somber condolences offering a small comfort to James and Lily, who were still grappling with the magnitude of their loss. Crouch, his face etched with lines of authority and concern, turned to Dumbledore. Headmaster Dumbledore, he began, his voice steady and commanding, what happened here? 
The ministry was notified of large magical activity in this area, and just as we were preparing to investigate, we heard that the Dark Mark had faded. What happened? Did you battle with the Dark Lord here and defeat him? Minister Bagnold wants a full account, and she wants it promptly. Dumbledore, embodying a serene composure in the midst of turmoil, responded with a measured gravity. We lost contact with Peter, he began, his voice steady and imbued with a deep, resonant authority. We went out looking for him, fearing he might be in danger. During our search, I was notified of the wards at the Potter's house breaking. There is no evidence to suggest Peter was attacked by Death Eaters so we now suspect Peter may be the spy we have been searching for within the Order. Crouch's reaction to the revelation of Pettigrew's betrayal was a mix of surprise and skepticism. Pettigrew, a spy? That's a grave accusation, Dumbledore, he remarked, his expression reflecting the gravity of such a claim. Dumbledore nodded solemnly, acknowledging the severity of his statement. Indeed, it is, he concurred. And yet, the evidence points to this grim reality. The world was told Sirius Black was the secret keeper to put people off and keep Peter safe as the real secret keeper. We had no idea Peter would betray James. The events of this night also confirm his betrayal. Without Pettigrew's betrayal, Voldemort could not have found this location. He then recounted the night's events, highlighting the survival of the children against all odds. When we arrived, we found Euphemia and Fleamont dead, but the children miraculously alive. Voldemort has been defeated, though I believe it to be a temporary reprieve. Dumbledore's gaze, usually filled with a spark of wisdom, was now clouded with a somber hue as he delved into his theory about Charles's role in Voldemort's defeat. From what I can deduce, he said, upon Euphemia's death while protecting Charles, a powerful magic, full of love, was invoked. This magic, I believe, empowered Charles Potter and played a crucial role in enabling him to vanquish Voldemort, at least for the time being. Crouch, absorbing the headmaster's explanation, displayed a rare moment of vulnerability, his features softening as the reality of the situation sank in. Orrors, he ordered sharply, begin your investigation immediately. Ensure every detail is meticulously documented. The unspeakables, meanwhile, had already commenced their silent, methodical examination, their movements almost spectral in their efficiency. They delved into their work without interruption, their focus undeterred by the ongoing discussions. The Potter residence, now a hub of investigative activity, bore the heavy air of skepticism and disbelief. Barty Crouch Sr., his years of experience as an aura edged on his face voiced his doubts. I cannot fathom how a child, only a year old, could have possibly defeated you-know-who, he muttered, his skepticism echoing the sentiments of many in the room. Over my time in the Aurors, I have seen many parents die protecting their children but nothing like this happened to the attackers. We must make sense of this scene to make sure you know who is dead. Dumbledore, holding Voldemort's cloak, met Crouch's skeptical gaze with a measured calm. This was found here, Barty. It's Voldemort's, and I believe it was worn by him tonight, he said, his voice low yet carrying the weight of his conviction. A shiver seemed to pass through the room at the mention of Voldemort's name, and Crouch's eyes narrowed in contemplation. Then it is imperative we ascertain the true nature of his fate, he replied, his tone stealing with resolve. Chapter 7, Shadows and Prophecies The unspeakables, shrouded in their usual aura of mystery, continued their thorough examination of the nursery. They worked in silence, their methodical approach a stark contrast to the swirling confusion and speculation around them. Dumbledore remained an enigmatic presence, his vast knowledge and understanding a closely guarded secret. He watched, his eyes betraying little, as the room grappled with the night's unfathomable events and the inconceivable notion that two young children had somehow played a pivotal role in Voldemort's downfall. Amidst the noise and the flurry of activity, two small figures in the nursery began to stir. Harry's bright green eyes blinked open, mirroring the awakening of his brother, Charles. In that moment, as their innocent eyes took in the room full of strangers, the future remained as uncertain as the questions that filled the air. Harry had been awake for quite some time, ever since the first group of people arrived. He was feigning sleep, keen to eavesdrop on the conversations swirling around him. With the influx of memories and experiences from his past life, he was unsure how to behave in front of his parents and the others. Should he reveal how he and his grandmother were responsible for thwarting Voldemort this night, or should he let them puzzle it out themselves? As he pondered this, he listened intently to Dumbledore's summation of the night's events. Harry was also confused about who the real prophesied child was. Although the birth date of Charles matched the prophecy, 
but tonight Voldemort was first killed by his grandmother's sacrifice and actions. Also since he was in front of his brother to protect him, he was the one on the direct end of Voldemort's spell that got countered. Later he defeated Voldemort again as the soul shard that had latched to his head was defeated by him. Charles played almost no role in tonight's events. Disregarding the birth date means that Harry himself was the prophesied child or the boy who lived. In the end, he made up his mind. Despite the prophecy suggesting Charles as the potential chosen one, Harry felt a profound sense of duty to shoulder the burden himself. His past life's experiences and the flood of memories made him the more fitting adversary for Voldemort, more so than his younger brother, Charles. Harry decided to embrace the role of the chosen one, albeit from behind the scenes, as he did not wish to make himself a target. To defeat the far more powerful Voldemort, he needed an edge, keeping Voldemort unaware of his true fated enemy could provide just that advantage. As he lay there, listening to Dumbledore's summation, Harry grappled with the implications of the wrong boy who lived scenario unfolding before him. He recognized the similarities to the fanfiction plots he had once read, yet the reality of the situation was fraught with danger and complexity. Despite the evidence, such as the runes, Dumbledore seemed to have hastily concluded that Charles was the one who vanquished Voldemort which Harry did not like since that put Charles on every Death Eater's kill list. Harry suspected that Dumbledore had ulterior motives. Putting Charles on a pedestal, especially when he was potentially the child of prophecy, seemed like a dangerous game. Since for now, Harry could not go against Dumbledore, he resolved to act from the shadows to protect Charles, countering whatever plans Dumbledore might have, while safeguarding Charles and his own secrets. As the room buzzed with activity, Harry lay quietly, his mind a whirlwind of strategy and determination. He was ready to embark on a path that would require cunning, strength, and secrecy. In the midst of the chaos and somber investigations, the gentle stirring of Charles in Lily's arms signaled to Harry that it was time to awaken. As he opened his eyes, the room's attention shifted towards the two young boys, the sole survivors of the night's calamity. Lily, her maternal instincts in full force, enveloped her children in a protective embrace. Oh, my darlings, she murmured, her voice quivering with a mixture of relief and profound love. You're both safe, and that's all that matters. As Harry's gaze drifted to the covered form of his grandmother, the harsh reality of their loss dawned on him with crushing clarity. The wealth of memories and experiences from his past life receded, giving way to the acute pain of a child who had lost his closest companions. Grandma. Harry's voice, frail and laden with hope and despair, cut through the room's heavy air. His eyes, wide and brimming with tears, were locked onto the still figure that had been his source of unconditional love and care. Lily, sensing the depth of Harry's sorrow, drew him closer, offering the solace of a mother's embrace. Harry, love, Grandma had gone to a better place. I'm here, she soothed, her voice a tender balm to his aching heart. Yet, Harry's focus remained unwavering on his grandmother's form, the stark reality of her absence piercing his soul. Tears cascaded down his cheeks, each a poignant tribute to the profound bond he had shared with his grandparents. His sorrow resonated through the room, a poignant reminder of the night's tragic toll. Lily her own eyes misting with tears, held Harry in a tight embrace. I miss Grandma too, sweetheart, she whispered back, her voice heavy with shared loss. Charles, stirred by the commotion and sensing his brother's anguish, joined in with his own cries. The room, already laden with the gravity of loss, was now filled with the heart-wrenching sounds of the children's grief. The echoes of their sorrow served as a stark reminder of the indelible impact the night's events had on the youngest members of the Potter family. The future once a beacon of hope and promise, now lay obscured, overshadowed by the dark veil of tragedy that had descended upon them. Chapter 8, A Child's Tale and a Family's Future Part, 1 After everyone had calmed down and the mood in the room had improved a little, Dumbledore approached the young Harry with a gentle inquiry. Harry, do you recall the events of today? He asked, his voice soft yet probing. Harry, instinctively wary, shifted his gaze away from Dumbledore. He had a lot of secrets and did not want Dumbledore to attack his untrained mind with legilimency and go through his memories or worse alter them. Harry knew Dumbledore could go to any lengths for his greater good. Lily, noticing Harry's reaction, sought to reassure him. What happened, Harry? It's all right, you can tell us. Dumbledore is here to help, she said, her voice soothing yet tinged with concern. Harry, channeling the innocence expected of his age, relayed his grandfather's warning. Grandpa said never look at strong wizards in the eyes till you have something called Mind Shield. 
he said they can see my memories and play games with my mind. He said I might go mad if someone reads my memories. He explained, his voice reflecting a child's understanding of complex magical concepts. Dumbledore's face registered surprise. He hadn't expected Fleamont to have taught his grandson such a cautionary lesson. Dumbledore had intended to gently probe Harry's memories, considering the knowledge of that night's events to be of paramount importance. But he wasn't about to admit this. The experienced Aura and Order member, Mad Eye Moody, observing the exchange, let out a gruff chuckle, his magical eye swirling independently. Good advice, boy. Constant vigilance. Remember, never look other wizards in the eye if you don't have strong mind shields. He remarked, appreciating the prudence in Fleamont's words. Lily, attempting to alleviate Harry's concerns, reassured him. Dumbledore wouldn't harm your thoughts, dear, she said softly, then gently prodded, can you tell us what happened today, Harry? Harry understood this was his chance to change the narrative. He didn't want his brother to be seen as the chosen one by the outside world. He wanted Charles to live an ordinary life. So, he decided to recount the events truthfully, strategically omitting his own role. He decided to credit the miraculous survival and the defeat of Voldemort to his grandmother's actions and the mysterious runes she had drawn. He liked the idea of his powerful grandma being seen as a hero by the wizarding world. With a quivering voice, betraying the emotional toll of his narrative, Harry began. Grandma was telling us a story with dragons when suddenly Grandpa stood up and said the bad guy was here. He told Grandma to take us upstairs and protect us. Grandma took us to Charles's room and started drawing something on the floor. She kept doing that while I could hear shouting from downstairs and lots of things breaking. Harry recounted, his young voice faltering slightly. After some time, Grandma finished writing, and suddenly there was a thud and everything went quiet. Grandma started crying and placed me beside Charles's crib. She then took out her wand and stood in front of the door. A ghost-like monster opened the door and came in. He asked her to move away, but she didn't, and then a green light came out of the bad guy's wand and Grandma fell down. Harry continued, his eyes brimming with tears at the memory. Then the bad guy approached us. At that time, Grandma's drawings lit up the whole room and everything glowed. Suddenly there was a white dome around the crib of Charlie which I could tell the bad guy couldn't see. When the bad guy tried to hurt us, the green light from his wand didn't work. It hit the dome and stopped. Then a golden light from the dome hit him, and he just disappeared. Then the whole room started shaking. That's all I remember, Harry concluded, his recounting leaving the room in a hushed, somber silence. Lily, her heart aching for her son's witnessed horrors and her mother-in-law's sacrifice, hugged Harry closer. The room absorbed Harry's words, each person grappling with the weight of his testimony. The room, steeped in the somber revelation of Harry's account, was enveloped in a reflective silence. His narrative, painting Euphemia as the knight's unlikely hero, resonated more deeply with the assembly than Dumbledore's initial theory. The concept of a pure blood which defeating the most feared Dark Lord through sacrificial magic found a more receptive audience among the wizards and witches present, many of whom held deeply ingrained beliefs in blood supremacy, than a one-year-old half-blood child defeating the Dark Lord with unknown love magic. It seemed, to Harry's relief, that his grandmother would be remembered as the hero of this tale, sparing Charles from an unwanted destiny. In his heart, he knew Grandma would approve of his actions. The gathered crowd began to scrutinize the rune remnants, validating Harry's description. Skeptical and curious glances were cast towards Dumbledore, whose initial theory now appeared less convincing. Dumbledore, perceiving the subtle shift in the room's sentiment, remained outwardly unruffled, though inwardly he acknowledged the delicate predicament he now faced. The flow of events Harry described matched what Dumbledore had concluded upon first entering the room. He had ulterior motives for putting Charles in the forefront, but he knew he could salvage this later. For now, he conceded gracefully. Chapter 9, A Child's Tale and a Family's Future Part, 2 Harry's words hold truth, Dumbledore conceded, his voice embodying calm authority. As I had suggested, Euphemia's sacrifice invoked a powerful magic. I initially thought this magic empowered Charles to defeat Voldemort, but it seems the magic did not need a medium. It appears I need to study these runes further. Their capacity to counter the killing curse is a significant subject to explore. Dumbledore, his expression thoughtful yet decisive, turned to Lily. Lily, he began gently, I believe it would be prudent to take the children to Hogwarts for a checkup with Madame Poppy Pomfrey. St. Mungo's might not be the safest place at the moment, given the confusion surrounding Voldemort's apparent demise. 
Lily, her maternal instincts in full force, nodded firmly. Of course, Albus, she replied, her voice steady but laced with exhaustion. I want to ensure they are both all right after tonight's ordeal. As they prepared to leave, Harry interjected, the bad man mentioned Neville. He said after Charles, Neville would be next. Harry hoped this warning might alter the fate of the Longbottom family, whom he knew were close to the Potters. Moody, ever the vigilant Auror, reacted promptly. After a brief discussion with Crouch, he hurriedly left, promising to warn the Longbottoms and enhance their security. With the situation clarified and a plan in place, Crouch prepared to depart. He stood, his posture commanding and official. I must brief Minister Bagnold on these developments, he announced. Turning to his team, he left instructions for the Aurors in a clear, authoritative tone. Secure the scene, he ordered, and ensure all evidence is preserved. We need a clear and thorough report for the Ministry. With a final, respectful nod to Dumbledore and a sympathetic glance towards James, he strode from the room. Lily, cradling Charles in her arms and holding Harry's hand tightly, prepared to leave for Hogwarts. Her eyes, red and swollen from tears, met James's. At that moment, their shared grief and love for their family were palpable. I'll remain here, James stated, his voice a mixture of grief and resolve. I must see to my parents' arrangements and settle matters concerning the house. Lily nodded, tears welling in her eyes again, but she understood. She leaned in, giving James a deep, heartfelt kiss. We'll be waiting for you at Hogwarts, she whispered, her voice trembling with emotion. Please join us as soon as you can. With heavy hearts but a clear purpose, Lily, Harry and Charles departed for Hogwarts, leaving James to face the daunting task of dealing with the aftermath and beginning the process of healing and rebuilding. In the cool embrace of the night, under a star-studded sky that offered little solace, Lily led her children away from the remnants of their shattered home. The weight of the evening's events hung heavily upon her as she moved towards the safety of Hogwarts, each step a solemn march away from a past now irrevocably altered. Behind them, James stood amidst the debris of a home that once resonated with happiness, now a somber monument to loss. His gaze lingered on his departing family, his heart heavy with the burden of what had transpired and the daunting tasks that lay ahead. Harry, walking hand in hand with his mother, cast a wistful look back at the house. A surge of melancholy washed over him, tinged with the realization that this childhood haven might soon become nothing more than a memorial of tragedy, much like God Rick's hollow in his past life's memories. This poignant moment underscored the stark divergence of his current reality from the narrative he had known in the books. As they journeyed towards Hogwarts, Harry's mind was abuzz with thoughts of the future. He wondered if his path would lead him to the Disleys as it had in the books, or if a different destiny awaited him. Plans and contingencies spun in his mind, preparing him for any eventuality that might unfold. Meanwhile, back in the Potter residence, Sirius Black, assisting with the investigation, stumbled upon a telling clue. His acute sense of smell, a gift of his dog Animagus form, detected an unmistakable familiar scent amidst the ruins, the scent of Peter Pettigrew. Conveying his discovery to James, Sirius's expression was a turbulent mix of anger and determination. I've caught Peter's scent here, James. He was present, Sirius stated, his voice laden with a sense of betrayal and resolve. James, momentarily distracted from his grief, was jolted by a wave of shock and anger. Find him, Sirius. Make him pay for what he's done to our family, he said, his voice steady despite the turmoil within. Sirius nodded, his eyes alight with a grim resolve. I'll bring Remus. We'll hunt him down. Pettigrew will face justice, he declared, his tone resolute. As Sirius vanished into the night, intent on his mission, Harry watched from a distance. He understood the challenges Sirius and Remus would face in tracking Pettigrew, especially given the rat's ability to hide in the most inconspicuous places. Yet, he held a glimmer of hope that with their combined skills, they might succeed in bringing Pettigrew to justice. Chapter 10, The Chase and Confrontation The night air was brisk as Sirius Black, transformed into his large black dog Animagus form, bounded through the streets with a singular focus. His senses were heightened, the scent of Peter Pettigrew lingering like a treacherous whisper on the wind. Beside him ran Remus Lupin, his face set in grim determination, his mind racing with the gravity of their mission. Their pursuit led them through the winding alleys of London, a labyrinth of shadow and stone. Sirius's keen nose guided them unerringly, the trail of Pettigrew's scent growing stronger with each passing moment. The city's nocturnal chorus faded into the background as they honed in on their quarry. After what felt like hours, 
the scent trail led them to an abandoned industrial area, its derelict buildings casting long, eerie shadows. Sirius, resuming his human form, whispered to Remus, he's close. I can feel it. Remus nodded, his eyes scanning the surroundings. Let's corner him. I'll set up an anti-apparition ward to cut off his escape routes. With swift, precise movements, Remus drew his wand, muttering incantations under his breath. A subtle shimmer in the air marked the completion of the ward, sealing the area. In the shadowed recesses of London's alleys, where countless rats scurried and hid, Peter Pettigrew had found an unlikely refuge. His animagus form, that of a common rat, allowed him to blend seamlessly into this unnoticed world. Pettigrew, with the cunning of a creature accustomed to evasion, had nestled himself amongst these rodents, confident in the anonymity the bustling colonies provided. But his sense of security was short-lived. The sudden intrusion into his hideout by unexpected figures sent a jolt of shock through him. Peering from his vantage point, Pettigrew's heart sank as he recognized the figures of Sirius Black and Remus Lupin entering the desolate building. He couldn't fathom how they had managed to trace him to this obscure hideaway. Sirius and Remus, having meticulously prepared the area with anti-apparition wards, moved with a purposeful determination. They were not prepared to let Pettigrew slip through their fingers again. Alerted to their presence, Pettigrew, in a panic, reverted to his instincts. His rat form darted from the shadows, a small, desperate figure seeking escape amid the rubble. But Sirius was quicker. With the agility born of years mastering his animagus form, he lunged forward, cutting off Pettigrew's path and forcing him to transform back into his human form. Peter. Sirius's voice, thick with fury and betrayal, echoed through the derelict structure. Why? Why did you betray us? Pettigrew, cornered and trembling, his eyes darting around wildly, snarled back. You wouldn't understand, Sirius. You always had everything talent, friends, family. I was always just the tag along, the forgotten one. You don't know what it's like to be ignored, to be treated as nothing. Sirius's expression hardened. You were our friend, Peter. We trusted you. You chose to betray us, to betray James and Lily. Remus stepped forward, his voice steady but tinged with sadness. Peter, you were one of us. We would have done anything for you. Why turn to Voldemort? Pettigrew's response was laced with fear and a twisted sense of pride. I was scared of him, Sirius. And he promised me power, something you and James always had. He knew of a ritual that would make me as strong and talented as you two, Pettigrew spat, his voice tinged with envy and bitterness. Sirius's expression darkened with each word. You betrayed us for power? You led the Death Eaters to the other Order members too then. He growled, his fists clenching. Pettigrew, a sneer forming on his lips, boasted of his betrayals. Yes, I led them to the Pruitt twins, to Edgar Bones. It was I who orchestrated their ends. Their sacrifice was nothing compared to the power I was promised. Sirius, incensed by Pettigrew's confession, stepped forward menacingly. Pettigrew, seizing the moment, aimed his wand at a nearby gas pipeline. If I can't escape, none of us will. He shouted, casting a spell to ignite it. Remus, reacting swiftly, deflected the spell and prevented the imminent explosion. The resulting blast rocked the area, but the pipeline remained intact. Pettigrew, realizing his plan had failed, looked wildly for an escape route, but the anti-apparition ward held firm. Sirius advanced, his wand trained on Pettigrew, his face a mask of righteous anger. You'll pay for your treachery. Peter. You'll face justice for what you've done, Sirius declared, his voice resolute. Pettigrew, now visibly defeated, slumped to the ground, his eyes filled with fear and despair. Remus, ever the voice of reason, cautioned Sirius. We need him alive, Sirius. He must answer for his crimes. Sirius was tempted to unleash the dark curses he had seen his black cousins use, but Remus's stern look reminded him of the consequences. But doing nothing did not feel right. Instead, Sirius resorted to unleashing his fury through a flurry of punches and kicks, each one landing with a bone-crushing force on Pettigrew. Remus, while ensuring Pettigrew stayed alive, allowed Sirius this moment of catharsis. He understood Sirius's need to vent his rage but was determined to prevent his best friend from crossing a line that would lead to Azkaban. Pettigrew, beaten and broken, lay at their feet, his plans of escape thwarted. Remus watched over the scene his heart heavy with the knowledge of what his friend had become. The betrayal of Peter Pettigrew was laid bare that night, 
a treachery that had cost the lives of many and shattered the bond of a once unbreakable friendship. Sirius stopped after calming his anger a little. Then together with Remus, they bound Pettigrew with magical restraints, ensuring he could no longer pose a threat. As they prepared to transport Pettigrew to the Ministry, Sirius cast a final glance at his former friend. The night had brought closure, but not the kind Sirius had hoped for. The betrayal of a friend, the loss of innocence, and the unearthing of hidden truths had marked this night as one of the darkest chapters in their lives. The journey back was silent, each man lost in his own thoughts. The events of the night had set in motion a series of changes that would ripple through their lives and the wizarding world. Chapter 11, A New Dawn The morning light of a new day greeted Harry as he woke in unfamiliar surroundings. The events of the previous night, so surreal and tumultuous, still hung over him like a dream. He had arrived at Hogwarts late at night and was taken directly to the hospital wing, where the brothers had to go through a thorough medical examination. He didn't get to even enjoy the view of the magnificent castle. Since school was still in session, Harry found himself in a temporary residence within Hogwarts, a secluded wing that had been swiftly arranged to accommodate the Potters. It was locked down and no student was allowed in there. Harry, tired from all the night's ordeals, had quickly dozed off during the checkup by the school matron and did not know what happened after that. Waking up to the new surroundings, Harry first pinched himself to confirm that this was reality. Last night's events all felt like a dream. He was woken up by people talking in the temporary residence but did not feel like opening his eyes and getting up from bed. He was still tired from last night's ordeals and also wanted to listen to the adult conversations. The people in the wing were his parents, Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, Madame Pomfrey, Dumbledore, and McGonagall. They discussed the events that had unfolded since the attack including the capture of Peter Pettigrew. Sirius and Remus had managed to apprehend Pettigrew, who had attempted a desperate escape by causing an explosion. The quick actions of Remus, aided by Sirius, had thwarted Pettigrew's plan, leading to his capture. Now he was bound in magical restraints to stop him from transforming and on the way for trial with the Aurors. The conversation then shifted to the Potter's future residence. Dumbledore expressed concern about their safety at Hogwarts, saying, you must move from Hogwarts quickly since it is not safe here with news out of Voldemort's defeat. The Prophet has got the news. The Death Eater spies among the students might try to harm the children to take revenge for their master. James, weighing the options, replied, I want to move too but will have to wait for the will of my father to be read at Gringotts this evening before I can decide on accommodation. All the Potter properties have gone into lockdown after my father passed away and I will get the location of the properties and access only after the will reading and claiming the Potter Lordship. Even the vaults have gone into lockdown, and Lily and I can now just access our personal vaults. Lily, however, added even if James gains access to the Potter Manor, I would prefer to not live in the Potter Manor. Those wards make it impossible for muggle items to be used in it. I want my children to be well versed with muggle items and how to use them like the television and radio. That is why we did not live there in the first place. Are there any other options? Sirius offered his rented house as a temporary solution, citing that the Black family home in London was not an option due to his mother's still residing there and her allegiance in the war. The Potters were looking for a permanent place so they declined Sirius's offer. Seeing that the discussion was going nowhere, Dumbledore said, let's wait for the will to see if there are any suitable houses, and if there are, you could live there. If not, I have a house you could use. I am currently looking into a ward that could help you. Since the failure of the Fidelio's charm, I have found a better option for a ward, and I will tell you about it later. It's just that you will have to make a difficult decision if you decide to use it. Dumbledore unconsciously looked at the sleeping Harry when he said this. James, steadfast in his resolve to protect Charles from any harm, affirmed his commitment to do whatever was necessary. With that, Dumbledore and McGonagall excused themselves, their responsibilities at Hogwarts and the Ministry demanding their attention. After the professors had left the room, Remus Lupin spoke by the way, the press has gone wild. I don't know how the prophet got all the information, but it had a field day. The paper is full of Voldemort's death, praising Aunt Euphemia as the heroine of Hearth and Home for ending the war and vanquishing Voldemort. They've detailed the entire event. It's unclear how they obtained such detailed information so quickly. I thought the Aurors and Ministry officials at the site were told to keep quiet about it for some time. Serious with a hint of exasperation, responded, they were, but the dark mark fading got all the people looking for answers. It seems one of the young Aurors present yesterday, in celebration of the end of the war and living through it, got too drunk and spilled the beans to some undercover reporter. 
so everything is out in the open. Then the ministry had to step in to make an official statement. Lily's concern shifted to Charles. It's all okay. But what I am worried about is Charles. Even the first conclusion said by Dumbledore was leaked, so now everyone is calling him things like the boy who lived for surviving the death curse. She said, worry evident in her voice. This isn't what we want for him. He's too young to bear such a title, and it puts him in danger. He has a great destiny, but I want him to live a normal life, at least for his childhood. James reassured her, don't worry, Lily. We will not let this affect Charles. I will talk to Dumbledore about this later. We will figure something out to make all this boy who lived nonsense disappear. Sirius and Remus nodded in agreement, their expressions showing solidarity with James and Lily's concerns. Lily was comforted with that. She knew that all this would make Charles an open target for Death Eaters, and she did not want to live in fear every day. So she hoped that things would die down quickly. The conversation then dwindled, leaving the room in a thoughtful silence. Harry, who had been quietly listening, decided it was time to wake up. Sirius was the first to notice and greeted him warmly. How's my brave godson? Did you sleep well? Harry, playing his part, replied, I slept without nightmares, thanks to Madame Pomfrey's potion. But I miss Grandma and Grandpa. Sirius, his voice gentle, reassured him. I miss them too. They fought bravely so that you could live, Harry. I don't think they will like you to cry. I am sure they will be watching you from the other side. Make them proud. Harry nodded solemnly, I will. To lift the mood, Sirius began sharing humorous tales from his Hogwarts days, eliciting smiles and light laughter from those in the room. It was a welcome respite, bringing a semblance of normalcy to the otherwise somber atmosphere. The day passed in this gentle, healing manner. For Harry, it was heartening to see his family coming together in support and love. It gave him hope that, unlike some of the darker narratives he had known, his life here would be one of inclusion and familial bonding. Chapter 12, Legacy and Lordship The following days at Hogwarts passed in a somber yet uneventful manner. The funeral of Fleamont and Euphemia Potter was conducted with quiet dignity, attended only by those closest to the family. It was a small, private affair, befitting the wishes of the departed. For Harry, it was a brief respite from the confines of the hospital wing, a chance to say a final goodbye to his beloved grandparents. The day following the funeral marked the reading of the wills of Fleamont and Euphemia Potter. Gringotts, the Goblin Run Bank, had long been the trusted custodian of such matters for many of the old wizarding families, who preferred the bank's impartiality and confidentiality over the ministry's influence. The reading was scheduled for 7 a.m. sharp at the Gringotts London office. Unfortunately, Harry and Charles were unable to attend, deemed safer under the continued care of Madame Pomfrey and Professor McGonagall at Hogwarts. The risk of exposing them to potential dangers outside the castle's protective walls was too great. The people who had bequests were contacted by Gringotts goblins to be there on time. The guests invited to the reading, arrived punctually, dressed in formal wizarding attire and all were escorted to the reading room by the goblin guards. The list included James and Lily Potter, Sirius Black, friends of the Elder Potters, and a few ministry officials. Albus Dumbledore though not personally invited due to his distant relationship with Fleamont and Euphemia, managed to attend as a representative of the ministry, invited to witness the will reading. James noted with concern the absence of the Longbottoms, whom he had expected to be present. Since the warning by Harry, the Longbottoms had been asked to remain under Fidelius for some more time and not come out prematurely to celebrate Voldemort's defeat. But James felt the absence of a person from the Longbottom family was concerning since the two families were close and he was sure he would see someone from the family here today. James shared his concern with Dumbledore. Perhaps they are still under the Fidelius and might not have received the invitation for the will reading, Dumbledore suggested, his tone embodying a reassuring calm. James, his curiosity momentarily assuaged, redirected his focus to the podium. At precisely 7 a.m., Bark Hoke, the goblin in charge of the Potter account, stepped forward to commence the reading. Thank you for joining us for the reading of the last wills and testaments of Fleamont Henry Potter and Euphemia Potter, nay Ackford, Bark Oak announced, his voice clear and authoritative. The wills shall read themselves aloud, and at the conclusion, they will be entrusted to the heir Potter for safekeeping. Parties with bequests in the wills will be presented their properties once the will reading is over. Bequests to individuals not present will be addressed later upon their contact with Gringotts. Please refrain from speaking until the reading concludes. Any interruption will result in immediate removal from the proceedings. 
we shall begin with the will of Fleamont Potter. The room settled into a hushed silence, the attendees bracing themselves for the revelations and bequests that the wills would unveil. The solemn atmosphere in the Gringotts reading room intensified as Bark Hoke, the Potter family goblin, carefully unsealed and unrolled a piece of parchment. A deep, resonant voice of Fleamont Potter emanated from the paper, carrying the weight of his final words. James, overcome with emotion, closed his eyes, a gesture of grief and remembrance. I, Fleamont Henry Potter, declare this to be my last will and testament, witnessed by my wife, Euphemia Potter, nay Ackford, and my barrister, Nathaniel Greengrass. The voice began, its tone both earnest and loving. To my beloved wife, Euphemia, should I leave this world before you, know that my love for you and our family is everlasting. Ensure our grandchildren know of my love for them. The bulk of my private vaults I leave to you, Euphemia, save for specific bequests to our dear friends. I also leave you with the rights to manage the Potter estate till the next Lord Potter claims his ring. The will continued, addressing the potential of both Fleamont and Euphemia's passing. In the event of our simultaneous departure, I task my son, James Doria Potter, to undergo the test of the Potter Lord Ring. Should the ring accept him, he shall inherit the entirety of the Potter estate and the bulk of my private vaults, excluding gifts designated for friends. A note of regret tinged Fleamont's voice as he contemplated an alternative outcome. If James is unable to pass the test, I express my deepest apologies to my son. Our late parenthood may have shielded you from the burdens and teachings of lordship. We thought we had time to teach you everything and mold you into the next Lord Potter, but it was not to be. For this oversight, we are deeply sorry. To James, I bequeath the contents of Vault 560, entrusting him to be a dutiful father to both his children. To Lily Potter, nay Evans, I leave the contents of Vault 561, with hopes of her continued kindness and care for our grandchildren. For my grandchildren, I have established trust vaults that would receive yearly payments till the time they graduate from Hogwarts. Without their explicit permission, nobody can access these trust vaults. The will then acknowledged Sirius Black's special place in the Potter family. To Sirius Orion Black, the contents of Vault 562, in recognition of your unwavering loyalty and love. You were as good a son to us as James and we hope for your happiness and the start of your own family. The Fleamont's voice in the will then proceeded to list various bequests to friends and associates. Then, Fleamont's voice addressed a crucial contingency. Should James Doria Potter not succeed in the lordship test, the airship passes to my grandson, Hadrian Ignotus Potter. Until the emergence of the next Lord Potter, the Potter estate will be frozen. The leftover contents of my personal vault will be transferred to the Potter family vault. I task the goblins with selling all the active businesses of the Potter family with the goblins taking a 5% commission on the sale and sending the earnings to the Potter main vault. The voice concluded with a heartfelt farewell. My beloved family, you have brought me immeasurable pride and joy. I will watch over you always. This marks the end of my last will and testament, so mote it be. The room remained in a respectful silence as the voice faded away, each individual processing the weight of Fleamont Potter's final wishes. For James, the moment of truth approached with the impending lordship test, a pivotal event that would determine the future of the Potter legacy. In the solemn atmosphere of the Gringotts reading room, Barcoke efficiently rolled up Fleamont's will, securing it with a red ribbon. His professional demeanor remained unaltered as he prepared to present Euphemia Potter's will. We shall now proceed with the will of Euphemia Potter. As before, I request silence throughout the reading, he announced, his voice echoing slightly in the quiet room. Breaking the wax seal, Barcoak allowed Euphemia's will to unroll. The room listened intently as Euphemia's voice filled the space, her tone imbued with a gentle yet firm resolve. I, Euphemia Potter, nay Ackford, declare this to be my last will and testament, witnessed by my husband, Fleamont Henry Potter, and my barrister Nathaniel Greengrass the voice began. Euphemia's will echoed her husband's in many respects, bequeathing additional vaults to James, Lily and Sirius, and ending with a heartfelt closure. This marks the end of my last will and testament, so mote it be. Once the reading concluded, Barcoke secured Euphemia's will with another ribbon. All right, that ends the will reading. The beneficiaries may claim their bequests at the main counter. Mr. James Potter, if you would kindly accompany me, we shall proceed with the lordship ritual, he stated, his voice maintaining its professional neutrality. As the other beneficiaries discreetly left the room, James, accompanied by Lily, Sirius, and Dumbledore, prepared for the next crucial phase. 
The air was thick with anticipation and unspoken emotions. James, his expression a complex tapestry of sorrow and resolve, stood ready to face the lordship test. Lily, her hand clasping his, provided a silent pillar of strength, her eyes conveying both concern and support. Dumbledore, ever the observer, remained in the background, his interest piqued by the impending lordship test. His presence was both comforting and curious, a testament to his vested interest in the Potter family's future. Chapter 13, The Ring's Judgment The hushed corridors of Gringotts seemed to magnify each step James Potter took as he followed Barkhope towards the ritual of lordship. The gravity of the moment bore down on him, each footfall echoing the significance of what lay ahead. They entered the account manager's office, a grand room that exuded the ancient and solemn history of the Goblin Nation. Its high ceilings and walls were adorned with detailed carvings, chronicling centuries of goblin lore. At the heart of the room stood a majestic chair, resembling a throne, where Barkoke seated himself with an air of solemnity. From a compartment in his desk, Barkoke took out an exquisite and ancient ring box. Barkoke then opened the box to reveal a magical ring, the Potter Lordship Ring, an emblem of heritage and authority. James recognized it instantly. The Potter Lordship Ring, a symbol of power and legacy, had adorned his father's finger for as long as James could remember. Its sudden absence and return to its box upon Fleamont's death was a stark reminder of the void left behind. Before going forward with the Lordship test, Barcoke brought out another, smaller ring box. Your air ring, air potter. You must relinquish that before proceeding. The ring will be passed on to young Hadrian in the future. Reluctantly, James removed the air ring, a piece of jewelry he had worn for over a decade and a half. Handing it over felt like parting with a piece of his identity. Bark Hoke, with a reverence that belied his stern demeanor, placed the air ring into its box and set it aside. Bark Hoke then retrieved the lordship ring, its insignia catching the dim light of the room. Do you, James Doria Potter, accept your lineage and the responsibilities of the noble house of Potter? He asked, his voice resonating with the weight of tradition. With a deep breath, James affirmed his acceptance, his voice steady despite the turmoil within. I accept and embrace the mantle of my birthright, he declared, sliding the ring onto his finger. A tense silence enveloped the room. For a moment, nothing happened, and hope flickered within James. But then, a sudden, searing heat radiated from the ring. Initially, James thought it was a part of the test, but as the heat intensified into an unbearable pain, the ring abruptly flew from his finger, returning to its box with a finality that echoed in the room. Bark Hoke, his expression somber, confirmed the ring's verdict. The ring has deemed you unworthy, Mr. Potter, he stated, his tone neutral yet empathetic. Your father suspected this might be the case. He believed that his own indulgence led you to become a follower rather than a leader. But remember, you still have time to contest this until the next heir claims the mantle. The path to redemption is never clear, but I hope you find your way. James, overwhelmed by the rejection, struggled to process Barcoke's words. The weight of the rejection bore down on him, and a storm of emotions raged within. As he left the office, his eyes, once filled with hope, now held a mix of sorrow and simmering anger. For the first time in his life, James Potter had been denied something he deeply desired, and he was adrift in a sea of confusion and resentment. James Potter, emerging from the depths of Gringotts, stepped into the grand hallway, his face a canvas of dejection and disbelief. The absence of the lordship ring, a glaring omission on his hand, was a silent testament to the events that had transpired within. Lily, sensing the weight of the moment, hastened to his side. Her arms encircled him, a gesture of comfort and solidarity. Sirius, standing by, offered a supportive pat on the back, his simple action speaking volumes of camaraderie and understanding in this moment of defeat. Dumbledore, ever the observer, allowed the moment to unfold, giving James the time he needed. But as the minutes ticked by, his piercing blue eyes sought answers. James, he began, his voice gentle yet probing, would you share with us what occurred? James, collecting his thoughts, recounted the ritual's outcome. The ring, it rejected me, Professor, he said, his voice tinged with disbelief. Barcoke said it was because I've been too sheltered, too influenced by others. He believes that my upbringing, the pampering, made me more of a follower than a leader and the ring did not like that. But he also said that I might have a chance in the future once I've grown and proven myself. Dumbledore's eyes deepened in understanding. He was well aware of the enchantments old families placed on their heirlooms. 
These enchantments were designed to ensure that the family's legacy remained untainted and that their leaders were strong, independent, and free from external influences. Dumbledore internally acknowledged that his guidance might have inadvertently overshadowed James's own decisions. The presence of Harry and Charles meant the Potter lineage had other potential heirs, and the ring might find them more fitting. However, he also knew that in cases where no suitable heir was available, the ring would reluctantly choose a lord, albeit not without reservations. Internally, Dumbledore wrestled with his feelings. The rejection of James as the Potter Lord meant a significant loss of influence in the Wizengamot. The light side, having suffered considerable casualties in the recent war, was now at a disadvantage. The balance of power was shifting, and Dumbledore was acutely aware of the challenges that lay ahead. While Dumbledore pondered the implications, his attention remained focused on James. This is not an end but a beginning, James. You still have an opportunity to contest this decision. The path to leadership can be arduous, but it is not insurmountable. We will work through this together. However, our immediate concern must be to return to Hogwarts. The Board of Governors is growing restless. They've made it clear that I cannot house outsiders at Hogwarts which would bring danger to the students. James, absorbing Dumbledore's words, found a glimmer of hope in the midst of uncertainty. The road ahead was unclear, but it was not without direction. Together, the group made their way to the flu network, ready to return to Hogwarts. The journey back was reflective, each lost in their own thoughts about the future that lay ahead. Chapter 14, Restlessness and Reflection Back at Hogwarts, Harry, confined to the temporary wing at Hogwarts, was growing restless. The past few days had been horrible for Harry. Being constantly under watch by adults at all times, Harry could not find any way to sneak out of the room and roam around Hogwarts Castle. Hogwarts was something that had fascinated his dreams in his past life and being inside it and not exploring it was a kind of torture. But there was nothing he could do since he was still a child and the adults never allowed him out of their sight. Another problem he had was constantly maintaining his childlike demeanor in front of the adults. Around his parents, Sirius, and other adults, Harry had to constantly remind himself to act his physical age, suppressing the maturity and knowledge that came from his past life. He did not want them to suspect anything and since he was under their sights at every waking moment, he had to act all the time. This continuous charade was wearing him thin. He longed for the privacy of a new home, where he could drop the facade and be himself, at least in solitude. Today was a surprisingly free time for him since most of the adults had gone to Gringotts for the wool reading. Madame Pomfrey was busy with some things and did not pay much attention to him so he could do anything he wanted to just without leaving the room. This was much better than the past few days but still not ideal. The pristine white sheets, the antiseptic smell, and the constant hum of Madame Pomfrey's footsteps were beginning to grate on his nerves. He tried to sneak out once, but the matronly healer caught him in the act, her eyes sharp and reproving. Mr. Potter, she scolded, I've looked after more children than you can count, and believe me, none of their antics ever got past me. You'll stay put until I say otherwise. Harry tried to sneak out a few more times taking it as a personal challenge against Madame Pomfrey's watchful eyes. But each attempt was thwarted, and with a mix of frustration and amusement, he finally gave up. Resigned to his fate, Harry turned his attention to Charles, who lay beside him, looking at his older brother and the matron in blissful ignorance. Charles, over a year old, was at that delightful age where he could babble a few legible words and toddle around, making him an engaging and somewhat entertaining companion for Harry. As Harry engaged in playful antics with Charles, his fingers inadvertently brushed against the distinct, wand-shaped scar on Charles's forehead. The scar's design strikingly resembled Dumbledore's elder wand, a detail that piqued Harry's curiosity and intrigue. The scar, rather than fading away, had remained prominent on Charles's forehead, defying the typical healing patterns known in the wizarding world. Harry knew that in the realm of magic, scars from mundane accidents usually healed quickly, vanishing under the skilled hands of a healer. But this scar, born from falling debris that night and not from the killing curse, seemed to mysteriously defy conventional magical healing. Harry could not help but wonder why since he knew for sure that the scar did not house a part of Voldemort's soul and was just a normal injury. Letting his thoughts wander, Harry realized that the scar if not healed was going to become a symbol of Charles's miraculous survival like Harry's lightning bolt scar in the canon. Despite Harry's efforts to shift the narrative towards their grandmother's heroics in protecting Charles, he understood that his younger brother was fated for fame. The boy's survival of the killing curse would forever label him as the boy who lived, marking him as a figure of immense interest and curiosity in the wizarding world. Harry pondered the implications of such fame. 
would it act as a shield, protecting Charles from the remnants of the Death Eaters, given that their master had been defeated by their grandmother? Or, conversely, would it make Charles an even more prominent target for those who sought to revive or avenge the fallen Dark Forces? With their parents alive and playing an active role in their lives, Charles's exposure to the public was inevitable. His frequent appearances would undoubtedly fuel his burgeoning celebrity status. Harry could almost visualize the fan clubs and adulation that would form around his younger brother. However, Harry harbored a hope with their parents' guidance and influence, perhaps they could prevent the proliferation of sensationalized boy who lived stories and merchandise. The idea of Charles being turned into a fictional character for profit, his true nature overshadowed by exaggerated tales and commercial exploitation, was something Harry desperately wished to avoid. He feared such fame could transform Charles into a narcissistic, spoiled child, lost in the illusions of grandeur. Harry, for his part, had never sought the limelight. In his past life, he had preferred a more secluded existence, content in his own social circle, away from the prying eyes of the world. The idea of being thrust into the center of attention was overwhelming, almost suffocating. Yet, with the unfolding events and the looming fame of his brother, Harry realized that a quiet, unobtrusive life might no longer be an option for him. As Harry continued to play with Charles, a part of him worried about the potential complications Charles's fame might bring into his own life. Their familial resemblance might grow more pronounced with age, possibly leading to confusion or mistaken identity. Harry could foresee situations where he resembling Charles, might be recognized as the boy who lived, attracting unwanted attention and possibly endangering his life. Navigating the path ahead, fraught with the complexities of fame and destiny, Harry resolved to protect both himself and his brother. He was determined to shoulder the burdens and trials that lay ahead, ensuring that Charles could experience a normal childhood, free from the trappings of narcissism and unwarranted adoration. Harry's protective instincts were firmly in place, ready to face whatever the future might hold, to safeguard the innocence and well-being of his younger brother, Charles. He just hoped nothing unexpected happened that would completely alter his plans and beliefs. Chapter 15, Unspoken Tensions As Charles gently fell asleep, Harry was once again left with nothing to do. He had tried to read one of Madame Pomfrey's medical books, but the complicated words just didn't make sense to him. Letting out a big sigh, Harry lay back on his bed and stared up at the ceiling, feeling utterly bored. Looking for something interesting to read, Harry reached for the only book on the bookshelf that seemed appealing, Hogwarts, A History. This book was written by Bathilda Bagshot, a well-known witch who lived near Harry's family in Godric's Hollow. Harry had met her a few times, and his parents knew her too, but he didn't know her well because he spent most of his time with his grandparents. The only thing Harry really knew about her was from the canon where Voldemort's snake, Nagini had killed her and then used her body to set a trap for the Harry on the Horcrux hunt. Within the pages of Hogwarts, A History, Harry found a fascinating escape. The book didn't have much about the founders of Hogwarts, but it did explain how Hogwarts was created. Hogwarts was built in the 10th century, a time when it was dangerous to be a witch or wizard because people who didn't have magic, muggles, didn't like them and often tried to hurt them. To keep the school safe from muggles, it was hidden in the Scottish Highlands with lots of spells, so any muggle passing by would just see ruins and danger signs. The book talked about the four founders of Hogwarts, Godric Greyfinder, Rowena Ravenclaw, Helga Hufflepuff, and Salazar Slytherin. They all wanted to create the best magic school in the world, and each of them set up their own house in the school for students who shared their values. Greyfinder was for the brave, Ravenclaw for the smart, Hufflepuff for the loyal and fair, and Slytherin for those who were ambitious and clever. However, not everything was smooth among the founders. Salazar Slytherin didn't want students from non-magical families, Muggleborns, to attend Hogwarts because he thought it would make it easier for Muggles to find out about the school. This caused a big fight with Godric Greyfinder, who was his close friend until then. Their argument led to Slytherin leaving the school. Harry thought about how their falling out reminded him of rivalries from stories like Madara Hashirama and Naruto Suzuki. Imagining Greyfinder and Slytherin calling out each other's names like characters from the Naruto anime made Harry laugh. Godric. Salazar. After that, nothing much about the founders is talked about in the book. The book also contained a lot of information about the various headmasters at Hogwarts and the major events that had taken place at Hogwarts during their tenure like the various Triwizard tournaments and the casualties each time. It was fun reading how despite the death toll, the tournament continued to be conducted for a long time. The tranquility of the hospital wing was interrupted by the arrival of the group from Gringotts, their somber expressions casting a shadow over the room. 
The atmosphere in the room grew heavy with their entrance, but it lightened somewhat when Charles woke up from the noise and reached out with tiny hands and looked for attention. As the adults gathered around Charles, Harry, still engrossed in Hogwarts, a history, observed the changes in their demeanor. His father, James, particularly caught his attention. Every time his father's gaze met his, Harry detected a hint of anger, almost as if he had taken away something precious from him. The absence of the Potter air ring on James's finger and the overall dejected mood of the group were clues that Harry couldn't ignore. Piecing it all together, Harry deduced that James had likely failed the lordship test. He had heard the adults discussing it and from what he knew of James, he did not have much hope of passing the test. Harry had even heard his grandparents discussing it. They had decided to give James lessons to learn the values of a true Potter and increase his chances after the war was over. From the attitude James had towards him just now, Harry could easily deduce that the ring had deemed James unworthy, and due to this, Grandpa Potter had probably named Harry as the next heir. Now, the current still childish adult James was jealous and angry at Harry for this. As if this was his fault. But this realization brought also brought a mix of emotions. On one hand, he felt pride in being picked as the heir Potter, but on the other, he sensed the brewing storm of resentment from his father. Harry had always known that he would inherit the title, it was his birthright but he had expected it to be passed down from James. Now, with this unexpected twist, it will be thrust upon him sooner than anticipated. He could now undertake the lordship test at 17, rather than waiting for James to pass it down. However, the evident resentment in James's eyes worried him. If James's anger persisted, and if Dumbledore or anyone else made certain suggestions, Harry might find himself having a difficult childhood or be sent far away from home in a fit of spite. This unexpected turn of events also brought a sense of urgency. Harry understood that he needed to prepare for an uncertain future, one where he might face challenges from his own family. He was determined not to let his circumstances dictate his destiny. While he recognized the limitations of his age and the overarching authority his parents held over him, he was determined to try. Harry had made a silent vow to himself to live this life to its fullest, free of regrets and he was going to try his best in ensuring nothing could stop him from fulfilling his promise. He would fight for a better future even if he ended up in an orphanage or, even worse, with the Disleys. Harry had read enough fan fiction to guess possible futures. Amid these thoughts, the hospital wing was suddenly bathed in a warm, crimson light. A magnificent phoenix appeared, its fiery feathers illuminating the room. The room fell silent in awe of the creature's majestic presence. The phoenix, with its regal bearing and captivating beauty, held everyone's attention. It circled the room gracefully before coming to rest near James. Its arrival and the soft trills from its beaks seemed to momentarily lift the heavy atmosphere, casting an enchanting spell over the occupants of the room. Harry watched, fascinated by the phoenix, his thoughts momentarily diverted. The presence of such a magical creature was a rare and awe-inspiring sight, reminding him of the wonders of the wizarding world he had yet to explore. The appearance of the phoenix, a symbol of renewal and resilience, seemed almost symbolic mirroring Harry's own determination to rise from the challenges he faced. Chapter 16, House Elves The sight of Fox, Dumbledore's majestic phoenix, always filled Harry with a sense of wonder. The fiery bird, with its shimmering feathers, was a symbol of rebirth, known for its healing tears and the ability to teleport. As he watched the phoenix, Harry found himself daydreaming. The idea of having a magical creature like the phoenix by his side was enticing. He decided to travel the world in the future, scouring every nook and cranny, in search of his own phoenix. But he knew he'd have to be strong, both magically and mentally, to embark on such a journey. Harry's musings were interrupted as James reached out for a piece of parchment clutched in Fox's talons. James's face darkened as he read the contents. The Longbottom Manor has been attacked by Death Eaters, he announced gravely to the group. Thankfully, there is no news of any casualties. The Death Eaters have been arrested. But Dumbledore asked us to go there immediately. Lily and James exchanged horrified glances. The Longbottoms were not just acquaintances, they were dear friends. Their shared experiences at Hogwarts and in the Order had forged an almost familial bond. Harry, look after Charles, Lily instructed, her voice trembling with emotion. Without waiting for a response, she and James hurried after Dumbledore along with Sirius. Madame Pomfrey, sensing her services might be needed, quickly spelled her office shut ensuring Harry couldn't access anything dangerous. She then locked the wing, leaving the two boys inside, and followed the others. Alone, Harry prayed for the safety of the Longbottoms. 
He hoped the Longbottoms came out of this attack without any injury and Neville would grow up in a happy, loving family. With the adults gone, Harry was bored again. He played with Charles for some time but the one-year-old boy quickly got tired and fell asleep. The quiet of his temporary housing and being closed inside eventually began to wear on Harry. In search of some form of escape, he briefly entertained the idea of sneaking out, but after a few half-hearted attempts that ended in failure, he resigned himself to staying put. With a heavy sigh, he redirected his attention back to Hogwarts, a history, hoping to find some distraction in its pages. Amid the stillness, Harry's thoughts unexpectedly drifted to another significant figure in his life, one he had momentarily overlooked amidst the turmoil, Myra, the Potter family's house elf. Myra had been a constant presence during Harry's early years, especially in times of conflict when companions his age were scarce. To Harry, Myra was far more than just a servant, she was a trusted friend and confidant. The realization that he had neglected to check on her recently weighed heavily on him, stirring feelings of guilt. The dynamic between wizards and house elves had always been complex, marked by varying degrees of dependence and affection. House elves are considered an integral part of many wizarding households. Unlike, in the muggle world where people hire nannies and maids to take care of their children and the house chores, in the wizarding world these things are undertaken by house elves. Wizards disliked doing these chores and felt doing these things beneath their stature hence there has never been a wizard nanny or a wizard maid in the whole history of the wizarding world. Seeing the ideal opportunity, house elves willingly took up this role. House elves are said to have been cursed by some wizard in ancient times which made their bodies unable to produce or absorb magic. But they need magic to survive. This made it so that to survive they need magic from another source. The source could be a wizard or a magical building. When house elves saw that the wizards needed someone to take care of their everyday needs, they volunteered for the role on the condition that they formed a bond with them. The bond lets the house elves able draw on their master's magic for sustenance. For generations, house elves like Myra had dedicated themselves to the care of wizarding families, becoming indispensable to their daily lives. Myra, in particular, had been a fixture in the Potter household, caring for Harry and his grandparents with unwavering loyalty. Lily Potter, however, like many Muggleborns, struggled with the traditional wizarding view of house elves as subservient. She did not like that the house elves were treated like slaves by some families. Despite knowing that the relationship was for mutual benefit since the elves needed the magic from the wizards, she felt house elves should not be treated the way they were. She and most people like her advocated for a more egalitarian approach, believing there was no need for the house elves to work for magic and the magic should be given to them for free since it was essential for their survival. This perspective had caused friction between Lily and Harry's grandmother and this was one of the reasons why Lily wanted to live with James in another home. Despite the familial disagreements, Harry had formed a deep bond with Myra. He cherished her company, often involving her in his activities and adventures outside the home. In the quiet wing, with his brother asleep beside him, Harry felt a pang of longing for Myra's company, for the familiar comfort she brought to his life. Myra was close to his grandparents so Harry knew she must be feeling devastated. Harry felt a surge of empathy for her. Deciding to check on her, he softly called out, Myra, Harry needs you. He was not sure if she could come to see him at Hogwarts. To his relief, a pop sounded, and Myra, the house elf, appeared before him. Her small stature and large, expressive eyes, filled with sorrow, immediately conveyed her grief. Her attire, a neatly kept skirt emblazoned with the Potter crest, was a testament to her association with the Potter family. Master Harry, Myra greeted, her voice tinged with sadness. The lines of distress on her face were evident. She was haggard and Harry knew she must have been suffering alone for the past few days without any company. After comforting Myra, who was grieving the loss of the elder Potters, Harry asked are you okay now Myra? Are you bonded to anyone now? Myra's eyes welled with tears. Myra met Master James a few nights ago, but he said they didn't need an elf. Mistress Lily doesn't like seeing Myra around. So, Myra has been at the Potter Manor, maintaining it. The Manor's wards provide Myra with enough magic to survive, Myra added. Feeling a profound connection with Myra, Harry asked, would Myra like to bond with Harry? Myra hesitated. Young Master might not have enough magic yet. Harry smiled confidently. Myra should try and see again. Harry feels he's grown stronger, perhaps due to the memory awakening and the absorption of the leftover soul energy from Voldemort's soul shard. To her astonishment, Myra found that Harry indeed had enough magic. They immediately went through the bonding process, and Harry felt a surge of happiness. 
he now had a loyal friend whom he could trust unconditionally. With Myra accompanying him, Harry was free from boredom. Their conversation soon turned to the abilities of house elves. Harry was astounded by Myra's magical capabilities. As he listened, Harry couldn't help but think how foolish many wizards were for not recognizing and valuing the immense potential of their house elves, treating them as mere servants rather than the magical powerhouses they truly were. Before she left, Harry whispered, Remember, Myra, our bond should remain a secret for now. Harry did not want to fight with his mother over this. Myra nodded in understanding. Myra will not speak of it, Master Harry, she promised, before vanishing with a soft pop. Left alone once more, Harry returned to his book, his mind a whirl of emotions. Hours later, Madame Pomfrey returned, her face pale and drawn. Your parents will be back late, Harry. Try to get some sleep. As Harry lay down, he felt a mix of emotions, sadness for the long bottoms, gratitude for Myra, and apprehension about the future. As sleep began to claim him, Harry realized that despite the challenges ahead, he was not alone. With Myra by his side and his newfound strength, he felt prepared to face whatever lay ahead. In this moment of reflection, Harry drifted into a restful sleep, gathering his strength for the days to come. Chapter 17, The Long Bottoms The tranquility of Hogwarts was a stark contrast to the turmoil unfolding at Long Bottom Manor. The once serene home of the Long Bottom family was now a scene of devastation, marked by the dark aftermath of a violent confrontation. The air was heavy, tainted with the remnants of dark spells as Aurors meticulously combed through the ruins, documenting the chaos left behind. The Long Bottoms, heeding Harry's earlier warning, had extended their period of isolation under the Fidelio's charm in hopes of eluding danger. Yet, despite their precautions, disaster struck. Somehow, four of Voldemort's strongest Death Eaters had gotten the secret to their house and attacked. The Long Bottoms, renowned for their courage, had faced a formidable assault from four of Voldemort's most ruthless Death Eaters, Bellatrix Lestrange, her husband Rodolphus, his brother Robistan, and the unexpected Barty Crouch Jr. Despite the renowned bravery of Frank and Alice Longbottom, the ferocity and numbers of their assailants proved overwhelming. Thankfully, Frank Longbottom's mother Augusta Longbottom's prompt response in summoning the Aurors ensured that the rescue came in time. Alastair Matt I. Moody, leading the Auror team, arrived in the nick of time, rescuing the Longbottoms from the continued torment of the Cruciatus curse. The Death Eaters, intent on extracting information about Neville and the whereabouts of Voldemort, were swiftly apprehended. When the team of Dumbledore and Potters reached the location, the Aurors were cleaning up and some healers were looking after the Longbottoms. They could infer from the scene that the Aurors' prompt arrival had averted a catastrophe. The Death Eaters, driven by a ruthless desire to extract information on Neville's whereabouts and Voldemort's fate, were captured before they could inflict fatal damage. Neville, fortunately, remained unscathed, shielded in a hidden room by his parents during the attack. Madame Pomfrey quickly went to look at the Longbottoms while the rest of the group went to Moody to learn more about the situation. Moody told the group thankfully we reached in time. There were no casualties. The insane Bellatrix was ready to torture the Longbottoms non-stop with the Cruciatus curse till she got the information she wanted. For now, their condition is stable but from my experience with the Cruciatus, they were exposed for enough time that they will likely live with the side effects for the rest of their life. Still, it's better than the alternative. James was puzzled, how did their Fidelius fail to? How did the secret of their location get out? I thought the charm was foolproof but now it had failed both times. Moody replied this time, the leak came from Barty Crouch's own household. His son got the identity of the secret keeper through him and used it to track the person down. From what we have learned, the brave fellow kept tight-lipped for a long time but in the end, the Death Eaters were able to get the location from his mouth. Augusta Longbottom is livid. It was bad enough having his son being found as a Death Eater, now he will have her after him. He will be lucky to stay in the ministry after this hits the news. Sirius said Augusta Longbottom is not someone you want angry with you. Crouch might end up with a job far away from any real power like the Director of Cleanliness if he's lucky. It's unbelievable that Crouch didn't notice his own son turning to the dark side. That alone could cost him his position. James, his mind still reeling from the ordeal and his own personal failures, asked Moody about the possible succession for the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. So, who's going to lead the Department of Magical Law Enforcement now? Moody, will it be you? I can't think of anyone else who'd fit. Moody, with a grim chuckle, shared his skepticism. The dark side won't let it happen. 
it will be a nightmare for them if I become the head. They will try to get someone who can be bought on the post. With Voldemort gone, many of them have started coming out that they were under the influence of the imperious curse to avoid punishment. Lies that won't hold in a proper Wizza Angamot trial. With a corrupt head, they just might be able to buy their way out of the punishment they deserve for their crimes. Sirius, his expression hardening, suggested action. Can we do something to stop this? Since we know Voldemort will be back one day, we should make sure that the Death Eaters are punished. We can't have Death Eaters freely walking around, gaining strength again. Everyone agreed to this but Dumbledore interjected with a sigh. It's a difficult situation. Unfortunately, we don't have the numbers at the Wizengamot to enforce strict action. Many of the neutrals were forced by the Death Eaters with threats, that they did not want to be punished for their role in the war. They will support a lenient punishment. And since now we have lost the Potter vote, our strength is weaker. James felt a surge of frustration at this. His inability to claim the Potter Lordship wasn't just a personal failure, it had broader implications. The thought of Death Eaters walking free, biding their time for Voldemort's return, was infuriating. Charles would have to face the Death Eaters who are going to buy their way out. In the midst of their intense discussion, the group noticed Augusta Longbottom making her way towards them. Despite the recent attack on her family, she stood tall, her posture betraying none of the ordeal's weight. It was clear she had fared better in the attack and was now able to move about on her own. I wish to extend my gratitude for the warning about the impending threat, she began, her voice carrying a mix of thankfulness and a touch of sadness. I shudder to think what might have befallen us without the heads up. James, could you please tell young Hadrian how much the Longbottom family appreciates what he's done? We owe him a great debt. Lily, ever the empathetic soul, replied with warmth, of course, we'll make sure Harry knows, Madam Longbottom. How are Frank and Alice holding up? Augusta's face clouded over for a moment, a shadow passing as she recalled the use of the Cruciatus curse on her son and daughter-in-law. They've been spared physical harm, save for the Cruciatus's lingering effects, she answered, her tone reflecting the pain of the memory before shifting to one of determination. But they're strong, both of them. They'll recover from this ordeal, stronger than before. And thankfully, Neville came through it mostly unscathed, just a bit shaken. The group then dispersed and turned towards assisting the Aurors with tending to the aftermath and clean-up. Dumbledore, sensing his presence needed elsewhere, took his leave, and gradually, the group got to work, each member lost in thought over the day's events. As they cooperated with the Aurors, their minds weren't just on the present but were also focused on what lay ahead. They were united in their resolve to ensure that as many of Voldemort's followers as possible were brought to justice for their crimes. This shared commitment helped them navigate the complex emotions of the day, reinforcing their determination to fight back against the darkness that had touched their lives. Chapter 18, Difficult Decisions Part, 1 After a somber return from the Longbottoms' home late at night, the group was visibly distressed. The aftermath of the attack left the Longbottoms physically intact but emotionally scarred, their trembling forms a testament to the horrors they had endured. Lily, her voice heavy with emotion, emphasized the urgent need for justice. We need to ensure those monsters are given the strictest punishment for what they did. I don't want them to roam around the streets free to harm any more people. Dumbledore, sharing in the sentiment, pledged to leverage his considerable influence to see the culprits confined to Azkaban for life. The conversation soon veered towards the safety of the Potter family. James said we now need to think about our own family's safety. I have heard that the Ministry is turning our old home in Godric's Hollow into a memorial and providing us with a new one. Dumbledore relayed the information he had on the topic. Yes, the Minister wants to make it a monument so that it reminds other people that light always wins in the end. I tried to stop it but she was adamant. Getting a replacement house from the Ministry will take time so we will have to consider other accommodations. We also need to change the ward used to protect your house since you can still be attacked. This recent attack proves that the Fidelio's charm is not sufficient. After a pause, he continued, I propose a new ward scheme for your new home. However, there is a limitation to this ward scheme. For the greatest effect, the ward can only accommodate three people. The number three is a strong magical number, and it will give the wards the most power. Lily's initial shock turned to outrage at the suggestion of leaving Harry behind. You can't be serious, Professor. Are you suggesting we leave Harry behind? Harry is my son, we cannot just leave him. Sirius, equally appalled, fervently protested the idea. This is madness. How can you even suggest separating a child from his parents? 
Harry is just a child. He needs his parents. Especially after the events of that night. James, wrestling with a complex blend of feelings towards Harry, chose to keep his thoughts to himself during the discussion. A storm of conflicting emotions raged within him a mix of jealousy and a sense of responsibility as a father. Losing his right as the future head of the Potter family hurt a lot. Every time he saw Harry, James couldn't stop thinking about how others might be making fun of him for not passing the lordship test. Back in his school days at Hogwarts, being the future Lord Potter made him quite popular, and he often used this to pull pranks on others. Now, he imagined those same people were probably laughing at him for his failure. I understand your concerns, but we have no other option. Our foremost concern must be the safety of Charles and the broader implications for our world. It's either you use this new ward scheme or trust the Fidelio's charm again. After seeing that no one gained another opinion, he continued since that's decided let's discuss where can we place Harry. Sirius was quick to volunteer. He can stay with me. Dumbledore shook his head. I'm afraid that's not possible, Sirius. You're too high profile a target and we cannot risk your family attracting Harry to their side through you. The young Harry would be an easy target for them to attract to their side. Sirius retorted I have not met my family in years. They cannot get to Harry through me and I am sure I will be able to raise him well. But Dumbledore still denied the idea. After a long discussion, where alternatives were rejected one by one for one reason or the other by Dumbledore, they concluded that Harry couldn't be placed anywhere in the magical world for his safety. The discussion then gravely turned to placing Harry in the muggle world. Dumbledore finally suggested, I think the best person to take care of Harry is Lily's sister, Petunia. She is family and Harry would receive the care and love he needs there. Lily's immediate rejection of the idea was palpable. Absolutely not. Petunia detests magic. Harry would be better off in an orphanage than with her, she argued, unable to hide her distress at the thought. Hearing orphanage, Dumbledore's thoughts couldn't help but go back to the time he met the young Tom Riddle at Wool's orphanage. He regrets not doing better for the young boy who went on to become his biggest headache. An orphanage cannot be considered under any circumstances. Moreover, there's a strategic aspect to Harry's placement in the muggle world that we must address. As many of you are aware, Charles is destined for significant responsibilities and roles within our community. To ensure he can fulfill these duties, he needs the protection of being the Potter heir. Dumbledore began, laying the groundwork for his argument. The will of Fleamont Potter explicitly names Harry as the heir Potter. However, for Charles to rightfully assume this position and the subsequent lordship, we need Harry to be seen as ineligible. The best course of action is to distance Harry from the magical world and our family traditions. This separation will cause the heirship ring to deem Harry unfit, allowing Charles to step into his rightful role as heir. Such a maneuver is crucial for Charles's protection against Voldemort's followers, who remain a threat at Hogwarts and within the Ministry, Dumbledore explained, outlining a plan that seemed to resonate deeply with James and Lily. This rationale appealed to both James and Lily, whose affections were more naturally aligned with Charles. His upbringing under their direct care had fostered a closer bond, in contrast to Harry, who had been predominantly raised by his grandparents, adopting their values and perspectives. James, in particular, understood the critical significance of the airship ring for Charles. I see where you're coming from, Professor. That ring isn't just a piece of jewelry, it's like a shield for Charles. Having it means he'd be safe from being wrongly accused or caught up in trouble he didn't cause. If the Ministry or anyone tries to blame him for something he didn't do, the ring and the rights that come along with it will protect him. It's a way to keep him safe from any tricks or false charges that could be thrown his way. He acknowledged, recognizing the protective mechanisms the ring offered against the political machinations and the lingering malice within their society. Chapter 19, Difficult Decisions Part, 2 James and Lily found themselves at a crossroads, their hearts divided between their two sons and the impending dangers they faced. Ultimately, swayed by Dumbledore's reasoning and their deep-seated desire to protect Charles from the shadows that loomed over their world, they acquiesced to the plan. The prospect of providing Charles with an added layer of protection, a safety net against the dark forces still at large, tipped the scales in favor of Dumbledore's proposal. Sirius, however, could scarcely believe what he was hearing. Incensed and feeling a profound sense of betrayal, he couldn't hold back his vehement opposition. How can you even think of stripping Harry of his rightful place for something as uncertain as this so-called protection? Charles has us his family to shield him from any wrongful accusations. This isn't necessary, he argued with fervor. Dumbledore, 
maintaining his composure amidst the rising tensions, responded, You underestimate the significance of the ring and its power, Sirius. Our battle against the darkness extends beyond personal grievances. We're preparing for a future confrontation with Voldemort, and sacrifices are unavoidable if Charles is to be ready for that inevitable clash. Despite Sirius's passionate pleas, his words were ultimately overshadowed by the collective decision. The room was heavy with the weight of their resolution, and Sirius, feeling isolated and defeated, stormed out, his disappointment with his friends palpable. Dumbledore, while outwardly composed, was internally pleased with the decision made. His gaze, often twinkling with wisdom, now held a depth of calculation as he mulled over the intricacies of the plan that had just been set into motion. Ensuring the safety of the wizarding world was a responsibility Dumbledore did not take lightly. His actions tonight, especially regarding Harry, were not made out of malice but out of a belief in the greater good. In Charles, Dumbledore saw not just a young boy but the potential for a leader who could one day stand as a beacon of hope for the wizarding world, much like Dumbledore himself had been in his prime. He was old and the wizarding world would soon need a new beacon of hope. Dumbledore envisioned Charles stepping into the role of the next Light Lord, a figure of immense power and moral fortitude capable of guiding the wizarding world through its darkest times. The unique circumstances surrounding Charles his miraculous survival, his lineage and the inevitable fame that would follow the final defeat of Voldemort at his hands positioned him as the ideal candidate to assume this mantle. But for Charles to rise to this destiny, he needed to be shaped by experiences that would strengthen his resolve and moral compass. Charles would need to be independent on not reliant on or burdened by an elder sibling. Dumbledore was acutely aware of the dangers that jealousy and rivalry could pose, having witnessed the corrosive effects of such emotions within his own family. The thought of Harry, growing up overshadowed by Charles's fame and potentially harboring resentment, was a risk Dumbledore was unwilling to take. He believed that separating the brothers was a regrettable but necessary step to prevent any animosity that might drive a wedge between them, much like the rift that had marred his relationship with his own brother, Aberforth. In Dumbledore's eyes, ensuring Charles's upbringing was unencumbered by sibling rivalry or the complexities of Harry's situation was essential for the future he envisioned. This decision, though painful, was made with the conviction that it was for the greater good of the wizarding world, a world that would one day look to Charles as its protector and guide. The room was enveloped in a solemn quietude as Dumbledore meticulously laid out the details of Harry's upcoming life with the Dursleys. To facilitate Harry's integration into the Muggle world, we'll need to temporarily suppress some of his memories related to our world. This measure will ease his transition. In due course, we can orchestrate a reunion, framing his absence as a consequence of a Death Eater abduction, Dumbledore explained, casting a vision of the future that was both complex and fraught with moral ambiguity. Lily, her heart heavy with a mother's love and worry, found the thought of erasing parts of Harry's past unbearable. James and Dumbledore were all for this plan and she had no better alternative or a way to convince them. Faced with the finalized decision, she resigned herself to the plan, prioritizing Charles's destined path over her immediate desires. And what about visits? Can I at least see him from time to time? Just to ensure he's well? She asked, hope lacing her voice. Dumbledore's reply, gentle yet firm, dashed her hopes. I'm afraid that's not advisable, Lily, he said. Any contact with the magical world could jeopardize Harry's safety and the effectiveness of the wards will place around Petunia's home. Moreover, it's important for Harry to grow up without harboring any resentment towards you or James. It would be best for him to believe he is an orphan, any alternative might provoke his anger. And such anger could potentially steer him towards a darker path. Accepting the harsh reality with a heavy heart, Lily acquiesced, if it's truly for the best. James still processing the reality of his son living in the muggle world, agreed, adding a note of caution regarding Sirius. We should also make sure Sirius doesn't try to, intervene. He's Harry's godfather, and I wouldn't put it past him to try and take Harry away from the Disleys. Acknowledging the validity of James's concern, Dumbledore agreed, a valid point, James. We must fortify Petunia's residence against not just dark forces but also any well-meaning interlopers, including Sirius. Dumbledore sat back in his chair, his eyes meeting those of Lily and James. They seemed to find some measure of comfort in the plan, their expressions a mix of relief and lingering concern. Yet, within the depths of Dumbledore's own thoughts, a more clandestine idea took shape. A few well-placed memory charms should suffice to maintain Harry's ignorance of the knight's decisions and prevent future resentment. For the greater good, he reassured himself silently, convinced of the righteousness of his actions. Dumbledore leaned back in his chair. Satisfied? 
then it's settled. Harry will stay with Petunia, under strong wards, and without any contact from the magical world until he receives his Hogwarts letter. Dumbledore pledged to Lily that he would keep a watchful eye over Harry, ensuring his muggle family did not mistreat him for his magical lineage. The parents, overwhelmed by a mixture of relief and sorrow, consented to the arrangement. As the group dispersed, each lost in contemplation over the weighty choices made, they returned to where Harry slept, oblivious to the life-altering decisions made on his behalf. Left alone, Dumbledore reflected on the evening's resolutions. Firm in his conviction that these sacrifices were necessary for the greater good, he prepared to exit, his mind already anticipating the challenges ahead in safeguarding the future of the magical world. With a final, contemplative look around the empty room, Dumbledore departed, resolute in his mission to protect and guide, even if it meant making the most difficult choices. Chapter 20, The Path Unchosen The next day, in the temporary quarters of Hogwarts that had become a makeshift home for the Potter family, a palpable tension hung in the air. It was a silent testament to the unresolved issues and emotional turmoil that lay beneath the surface. Sirius's absence was notably felt, his departure the night before marking a rift in the group after his unsuccessful attempt to sway the decision regarding Harry's fate. James, Lily and Remus each wore a facade of normalcy, yet their forced smiles and the way their gazes drifted into the distance when they thought Harry wasn't looking revealed their true states of mind. Lily's eyes were often filled with sadness, while James and Remus wrestled with their own inner conflicts. Harry sensed something was off with the behavior of his parents but chalked their mood off to the attack at Longbottoms yesterday. Initially, in the chaos following Voldemort's defeat, Harry harbored fears of being sent to live with another family, or worse, being sidelined an outcome he had read in many fandoms. However, as time went on and life within the temporary home returned to a semblance of normality, with his parents showing him the same love and attention as before, Harry gradually dismissed these concerns. The thought that his parents might actually be planning to send him to live with the Disleys, of all people, never once crossed his mind. The day stretched on with an awkward atmosphere in the room, each hour more tense and monotonous than the last. Harry decided to focus his attention on his younger brother Charles, just to pass his time. He teased Charles throughout the day, eliciting a few laughs but mostly tears until either Lily or James intervened to comfort their younger son. As dusk settled, Dumbledore, unaccompanied by McGonagall, made his appearance in the wing. His solitary presence signaling the gravity of the situation. Dumbledore's gaze lingered on the sleeping Harry, whose peaceful expression remained oblivious to the life-altering decisions being made around him. Dumbledore, after a moment of contemplation, gently cast a sleeping charm on Harry, ensuring he would remain undisturbed during what was to come. Lily, tears glistening in her eyes, whispered a tender goodbye with a kiss on Harry's forehead, a silent promise of love and protection whispered into the night. James, his expression a complex mix of relief and regret, after a moment's hesitation placed his hand on Harry's head, a silent gesture of farewell. Dumbledore then carefully picked up Harry, and the small group quietly exited Hogwarts, their silent procession marked by a shared sense of solemnity. After a brief moment that allowed the Potters to say their final goodbyes, Dumbledore, with Harry securely in his arms, operated away to a predetermined destination. A few hours later, Dumbledore arrived at Privet Drive, a street that prided itself on its normalcy, where the most exciting thing to happen was perhaps a neighborhood barbecue. Number 4, Privet Drive, was a perfectly ordinary house, with a well-manicured lawn and flowers that seemed to scream respectable. It was the kind of place where one would least expect to find anything related to the magical world. It was here, in this most ordinary of settings, that Dumbledore planned to entrust Harry's care. Here, Dumbledore found Professor McGonagall waiting for him, disguised as a tabby cat. McGonagall, still in her cat form, watched from the shadows, her feline eyes reflecting her concern. Albus, are you sure about this? She asked as she transformed back into her human form. I have been watching them all day and from all my experience with the muggles, I can rightly say that the Disleys are the worst sort of muggles. I am sure you are exaggerating, Minerva. I am aware of a few of their shortcomings, but I have spoken to Petunia. She understands the importance of taking Harry in. I will take steps to ensure Harry receives the care he needs, Dumbledore replied, his voice carrying a weight that silenced further objections. But what if Harry decides to run away? He is not going to like this. Albus, Harry's resourceful, even at his age. The likelihood of him trying to return to our world is not insignificant, McGonagall pressed, her voice laced with worry. Acknowledging the validity of her point, Dumbledore reassured her. Rest assured, Minerva. 
I've implemented safeguards to prevent just such an occurrence. Harry's safety and well-being are my utmost priorities, he stated, a hint of finality in his voice as they prepared to leave Harry in the care of the Disleys. Unbeknownst to Professor McGonagall, Dumbledore had intricately woven a series of charms around Harry, creating a protective cocoon designed to shield him from the outside world and prevent any untimely re-entry into the magical realm. This web of enchantments included a subtle tracking charm to keep tabs on Harry's movements, an owl ward to block any early attempts at magical communication, and a memory charm specifically tailored to blur Harry's recollection of his past interactions within the wizarding community. Additionally, Dumbledore had cast a magical suppressant to curb any accidental magical outbursts, a necessary precaution for a young wizard growing up in a muggle household. Each spell was meticulously chosen, representing a strand in the complex safeguarding of Harry's new, isolated existence one devoid of any wizarding influences until Dumbledore deemed the moment ripe for his reintegration. Dumbledore justified these measures as essential safeguards, not just for Harry's well-being but as a bulwark against potential threats from those still loyal to Voldemort's cause. He acknowledged the physical and magical toll these charms might extract on Harry but consoled himself with the belief that such sacrifices were justified for the broader protection they afforded. However, Dumbledore was unaware of the broader implications of his enchantments. The memory charm, in particular, had a profound effect, dulling not only Harry's recent memories but also obscuring the deeper, recently awakened memories from his past life. This unintentional memory suppression effectively reset Harry's awareness to that of an amnesiac four-year-old. Had Dumbledore just applied the memory charm to just a couple of years of memories, the whole plan would have failed since with memories of life years above his current age, Harry would have easily seen through the motives of Dumbledore and escaped easily. Similarly, the charm designed to isolate Harry from Sirius inadvertently also blocked Myra, Harry's house elf friend, from locating him, thwarting any alternate plans for escape or assistance. The next morning, when the sleeping Harry wakes up, he will be a clean sheet without any memories. He will be confused and at the mercy of the Disley family. Things did not bode well for our protagonist. As Dumbledore gently positioned Harry on the doorstep of number four, Privet Drive, he did so with a sense of solemn responsibility, wrapping the boy snugly in his blanket against the chill of the night. Dumbledore had initially considered placing a squib member of the Order of the Phoenix near Harry for added protection and supervision. However, upon reflection, he decided against it. He reasoned that with James, Lily, and Charles drawing the attention of the wizarding world, Harry would likely remain under the radar. There seemed to be no need for extra protection or expenditure. Dumbledore earnestly hoped Harry would have a good life at Petunia's. He had visited her that afternoon, outlining the benefits of taking Harry in and impressing upon her the importance of family. After all, a family would always take care of each other. That was the power of love. Before departing, Dumbledore finalized the wards he had meticulously prepared around the Disley residence. These wards, innovative and potent, were designed to both conceal Harry from magical seekers and to be powered by the presence of love within the household a safeguard rooted in one of magic's most profound and least understood forces. This warding system was contingent on the Disley's treatment of Harry. Should their care falter, indicated by a weakening of the wards, Dumbledore would be alerted to Harry's plight, enabling him to intervene if necessary. This measure was Dumbledore's safeguard against replicating the neglect that had shaped Tom Riddle's early years. With a final, lingering look at the slumbering child, Dumbledore whispered a quiet wish for Harry's well-being. Good luck, Harry Potter. We'll meet again when the time is right. Then, with the soft rustle of his cloak, Dumbledore disappeared into the night, leaving Harry with a new life that would shape him in ways yet unknown. Chapter 21, The Diverging Journeys The following morning at number 4, Privet Drive, the crisp light of dawn brought with it a revelation that would forever change the course of a young boy's life. Harry Potter, waking up on the doorstep of the Disleys, found his mind clouded with confusion and disorientation. The memory charms Dumbledore had woven around him had done their work, blurring his recollections of the magical world and Harry's past life's memories. Harry felt lost, his mind a haze of fragmented images and muffled sounds which he struggled to piece together. As he attempted to orient himself, the door before him creaked open, revealing Petunia Disley. Her features were sharp, her demeanor cold, as she looked down at him. So, you're Lily's boy? she remarked, her voice carrying neither warmth nor welcome. Well, come in then. Don't dawdle. The stranger, standing above Harry with a look of disdain, was a stark contrast to the warm, loving faces he vaguely recalled in the recesses of his mind. Her voice, devoid of any affection, ushered him into the house a place that would become his new home. Harry, 
taken aback by her unwelcoming demeanor, hesitantly followed her inside. The house, though impeccably clean, felt sterile and unwelcoming, and before he could have a look at the interiors of the house, the strange lady stopped in front of what looked like a storage area near the entrance of the house, under the stairs. Petunia standing there introduced the small cupboard under the stairs to Harry, informing him that this would be his room. The cramped space, devoid of any comfort, immediately felt suffocating to Harry, but he had no choice but to accept it. His clouded mind was unable to think of anything much less running away from here. The cupboard under the stairs, small and suffocating, was a stark departure from any semblance of home he might have hoped for. It was here, in this confined space, that Harry was to make his new home. The absence of warmth and comfort made the cupboard seem more like a cell than a bedroom. Meanwhile, at Hogwarts, the return of Sirius Black was marked by a whirlwind of emotions. Driven by deep concern and unresolved disputes, he was determined to ensure that Harry, his godson, would remain within the magical realm, preferably under his own guardianship. His dismay quickly escalated to outright indignation upon discovering that Harry had been sent to live with the Disleys. When despite Sirius's pleading, they did not give him Petunia Disley's address, Sirius stormed away. Feeling betrayed by those he once considered close, Sirius cut ties with them. Sirius's knowledge of Lily's sister, Petunia, led him to believe that Harry's new home environment would be far less nurturing than even his own challenging upbringing within the Black family. In his eyes, the decision to place Harry in a home devoid of magical affection was unfathomable. This realization compelled Sirius to sever ties with those who had supported Dumbledore's plan. Back in the solitude of his own residence, Sirius was consumed by a mix of anger and resolve. The thought of Harry, his beloved godson, being raised by muggles with no appreciation for magic was more than he could bear. The sense of betrayal ran deep, prompting him to vow to do whatever it took to retrieve Harry and return him to his rightful place in the wizarding world. Sirius launched into a desperate search for Harry, leveraging old contacts and exhaustively combing through records in hopes of locating and rescuing him. His efforts, however, stood in stark contrast to the tranquility that pervaded Hogwarts. Dumbledore carried on with his responsibilities at Hogwarts, periodically checking the magical tracking charm he had embedded to monitor Harry's safety. Observing the steady signal from the charm tracking his special love-based wards, Dumbledore was under the impression that Harry had been warmly received by the Disley family. However, Dumbledore's assumptions were far from the truth. The effective operation of the wards he had intricately designed required an initial foundation of love between Harry and Petunia Disley. Unfortunately, such a bond of affection was conspicuously absent from the outset, leading to a critical failure in the ward's activation. Rather than functioning as intended, the wards inadvertently drew upon Harry's constrained magical energy to sustain themselves. Consequently, despite the apparent normalcy indicated by the tracking charm, the situation at Privet Drive was far from the secure and welcoming environment Dumbledore had envisioned. Dumbledore, aware of Sirius's relentless search, took measures to keep Harry's whereabouts hidden, even going so far as to alert ministry officials to Sirius's movements in the Muggle world. These actions, while drastic, were deemed necessary by Dumbledore to safeguard the greater good and ensure the future security of the wizarding world, with a particular focus on Charles Potter's well-being. As days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, Harry's life at the Disleys settled into a grim, monotonous routine. The vibrant memories of the magical world he once knew faded into the recesses of his mind, replaced by the drudgery of household chores, the cold indifference of his Aunt Petunia, and the looming presence of his Uncle Vernon. Any remnants of magic became distant, fragmented dreams, almost entirely erased by the harsh reality of his new life. The cupboard under the stairs, small and claustrophobic, became his refuge and his prison. In stark contrast to Harry's everyday struggles, Charles Potter's life unfolded under the bright spotlight of the wizarding world's adoration. Celebrated as the boy who lived, Charles became a living emblem of triumph over darkness, his existence infused with the community's collective hope for a brighter future. Each of his achievements was heralded as a testament to the resilience and strength of the magical world, eager to leave the shadows of Voldemort's reign far behind. As the Wizarding Society gradually healed, embracing a semblance of peace and stability, the Ministry of Magic embarked on a journey of reconstruction and reconciliation. High-profile trials sought to bring the remnants of Voldemort's followers to justice, although many slipped through the cracks, cloaking themselves in claims of coercion by the imperious curse. Amidst this backdrop of renewal, James and Lily Potter found themselves grappling with a silent guilt over Harry's fate, a secret sorrow that lingered in their hearts. To forget this pain, they devoted themselves to Charles, showering him with all the love and care they could muster. 
they watched with a mixture of pride and joy as Charles grew into a young boy of charm and charisma, blissfully unaware of the starkly contrasting path his brother tread in a world devoid of magic and warmth. Meanwhile, Sirius Black, fueled by a potent mix of love, guilt and unwavering loyalty, pressed on in his quest to find Harry. His resolve never wavered, even as he faced countless setbacks and false leads. To Sirius, Harry was more than just a godson, he was a reminder of a promise made, a promise to protect and cherish. He believed with every fiber of his being that Harry deserved to know the love and wonders of the world he was born into. As the months passed, the two brothers' lives continued on their divergent paths. Harry, in the non-magical world, knew nothing of his true heritage, his identity shrouded in secrecy and silence. Meanwhile, Charles lived a life full of magical wonders, the shadow of his missing brother a faint, almost non-existent whisper in the background of his privileged existence. Thus, the Potter brothers' journeys diverged sharply, shaped by the decisions made in the aftermath of tragedy. Harry Potter's story, once intertwined with the magical world he was born into, had become a tale of endurance in an environment that knew nothing of his past or potential. Yet, the wheels of fate continued to turn, weaving a complex tapestry that promised their paths might one day converge again. In the grand scheme of destiny, the separation of the Potter brothers was but a chapter in a larger saga yet to unfold. Chapter 22, Two Years Later October 30, 1983 Two years had slipped by since Harry Potter had been left at the Disley's doorstep at Number 4, Privet Drive. The world beyond those narrow confines had become a blur to him, a realm of possibilities too remote to even dream about. Each day for Harry began with the jarring sound of banging on his cupboard door, his cramped space beneath the stairs serving as a stark reminder of his place in the Disley household. Struggling to recall anything from before he was four brought a throbbing pain to his head, a pain Aunt Petunia dismissed with claims of an injury erasing his memories. This morning, like every other, began with Petunia's shrill voice. Up now, boy. Don't dawdle, we're hungry. Her commands had shaped Harry's mornings since his arrival. Every household chore fell upon his young shoulders, with harsh punishments for mistakes and a complete absence of praise. Hurrying to the bathroom to freshen up, and then rushing to the kitchen, Harry embarked on his daily routine. Today's breakfast menu demanded bacon, sausages, and toast. He worked meticulously, fearing Uncle Vernon's wrath for any culinary misstep. His heightened senses became his guardians against error. In the dining room, the Disleys sat awaiting their meal. Dudley, who was three, was talking about his birthday which was months away. Dad, I want more presents this year. One for each year I'm old. Uncle Vernon, half listening, agreed just to keep Dudley quiet. Fine, fine, as many as you are old. Now eat. Dudley's face lit up at the idea, already daydreaming about a future filled with ever-increasing piles of gifts. Harry served the breakfast quietly, his presence barely acknowledged by the family. As they ate, he stood at the corner, waiting to clear the table and have his own meal of leftovers. Then it was time for school. The Disleys didn't really want to send Harry to school, but they had to because everyone else did. They had no interest in providing for Harry's education, but begrudgingly bowing to societal norms, had enrolled him in the most affordable, least prestigious school they could find. The school offered no respite from Harry's dreary life. Each day, Harry made the long, 45-minute walk to the school since the school they found was far away and the Disleys could not care to arrange daily transportation for him. The school stood as a drab, uninviting structure at the end of his trek. Its corridors echoed with the laughter and chatter of children, sounds that seemed alien to Harry. He walked through these halls like a ghost, unnoticed and overlooked, except when trouble found him, which it often did. Harry's school life was a replica of his world at the Disleys. In the classroom, he occupied a small, inconspicuous corner, his desk a shield against the curious eyes of his classmates. The teachers, influenced by Uncle Vernon's preemptive declarations of Harry's troublesome nature on the very first day, treated him with a blend of indifference and suspicion. This treatment only cemented his isolation, building an invisible wall between him and the rest of the class. Academically, Harry had learned to navigate a precarious path. His early days at school had shown promise. He had a natural aptitude for learning, his sharp mind grasping concepts with ease. However, his first glowing performance on a test had brought accusations of cheating, a bitter lesson about the dangers of standing out. Since then, he had deliberately kept his grades average, avoiding both the bottom and the top of the class. The playground was no better. It was a battlefield where Harry was often the unwitting target. The bullies, 
sensing an easy victim in the solitary, quiet boy, found ways to pin their mischief on him. Harry bore the brunt of their actions, his protests falling on deaf ears. The teachers, conditioned to see him as a troublemaker, seldom believed his side of the story. This injustice stung, but Harry learned to endure it, his resilience growing with each unfair punishment. Lunchtime was a lonely affair. While other children grouped together, sharing food and stories, Harry sat alone, his lunch often nothing more than a sandwich or a small apple. He would watch the others, their laughter a distant melody, a reminder of a camaraderie he was barred from. Even attempts to join in were met with scorn or indifference, reinforcing his solitary existence. In the classroom, he was often the target of snide remarks or the butt of jokes. His silence and lack of response only encouraged more of the same. Harry had long since learned that defending himself only led to more trouble. He had become adept at wearing a mask of indifference, a shield against the constant barrage of negativity. As the school day drew to a close, Harry would prepare for his journey home. His heart, heavy with the day's burdens, longed for a reprieve, but he knew none awaited him. The walk back was a mirror of his morning trek, filled with the same solitude and introspection. The prospect of returning to the Disleys to face an evening of chores did little to lift his spirits. Harry's reputation in the neighborhood, tarnished by Aunt Petunia's rumors, ensured his isolation. No friends awaited him, no playdates, only the looming chores at home. Back at Privet Drive, his afternoons were spent tending the lawn and garden, a task he did with mechanical precision. Preparing tea for Uncle Vernon followed, then the cleaning of the house. Every chore was a race against time, a sprint towards the temporary respite of dinner preparation. Exhausted, Harry would eat his meal alone, often a meager serving of whatever leftovers remained from the Disley's dinner. The day would end as it began, in the confines of his cupboard. There, in that small, dark space, he would finally close his eyes, succumbing to a night of dreamless sleep, a brief escape from the unyielding reality of his life. In this life of shadows and silence, Harry Potter's spirit was tested daily. Yet, within him, a spark of resilience flickered, refusing to be extinguished. It was this resilience that carried him through each day, each challenge, each moment of despair. Chapter 23, The Accident October 31, 1983, Harry six years old. At the break of another monotonous day in the life of Harry Potter, the dreary morning at number 4, Privet Drive was shattered by the harsh sound of Aunt Petunia's voice demanding he wake up. The clamor of her banging on the cupboard door served as a rude awakening. Up now, boy. Don't dawdle, we're hungry. She screeched, her voice slicing through the stillness of the morning. Harry, groggy and cramped from another night spent on the hard floor of his cupboard, obediently crawled out. He hurriedly freshened up, a routine perfected over years of neglect, and made his way to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Uncle Vernon departed for work shortly after, his departure as silent and indifferent to Harry's presence as ever. With the morning's tasks behind him, Harry prepared for school, setting out on the long walk to the dreaded place. In school, he settled into his usual corner, a shadow among his peers. Sitting in his usual corner, Harry's mind drifted to dreams of a better life. Despite the isolation and bullying at this place, Harry persevered since he believed that education was his only ticket to a better future and a way out of the confines of Privet Drive. The idea of quitting school never crossed his mind, he knew it would only please the Disleys relieving them of the financial burden of his education. On that particular day, to Harry's surprise, the usual tormentors seemed preoccupied with a new card game, leaving Harry to his solitude. He watched them from afar, longing to be part of the group, to just be another normal kid. But fear and past experiences kept him rooted to his spot. Class ended, and Harry began his solitary walk home. His mind wandered to grand daydreams of success and revenge against the Disleys. He imagined them begging for his forgiveness as he looked down on them from the heights of his success. The thought brought a rare smile to his face. Preoccupied with his thoughts, Harry absent-mindedly crossed the road, failing to notice the car speeding around the bend. The driver slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The car hit Harry, and the impact sent him tumbling to the ground, darkness swiftly enveloping him. The driver, a man in his forties, leaped out of his car, his heart racing with panic. He rushed to Harry's side, finding the boy unconscious but, miraculously, without any apparent serious injuries. Hey, kid, can you hear me? He asked, gently shaking Harry, but there was no response. Gathering a crowd of onlookers, the driver asked about Harry's home. Where does this boy live? I need to get him to his family, 
he inquired, his voice laced with concern. That's the Potter boy. Lives at number four, over there, a neighbor pointed out. With help, the driver carried Harry to the Disley's doorstep. Petunia answered, her expression souring at the sight of Harry. What's happened here? She demanded, her tone more accusatory than worried. The driver, flustered, explained the accident and offered some compensation. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't see him in time. Here's some money for any medical expenses. Vernon, drawn by the commotion, appeared at the door, his immediate reaction one of irritation. What's all this, then? Harry. What have you done now? He accused, glaring at the unconscious boy at their doorstep. Despite sensing the palpable hostility from the Disleys towards Harry, he felt it was not his place to interfere further in family matters. With another apologetic look, he left the scene, relieved that he hadn't caused more serious harm to the young child and that his family had not called the police. Unbeknownst to the driver, the Disleys had no intention of involving the police, regardless of the severity of the situation. Their fear of any official scrutiny that might expose their neglectful, if not abusive, treatment of Harry outweighed any concern for his well-being. Thus, they opted to handle the situation privately, ensuring their secrets remain safely concealed from the prying eyes of the world outside Number 4, Privet Drive. After the driver's departure, any facade of concern from Petunia and Vernon quickly vanished into the ether. With a disregard that bordered on cruelty, they hauled Harry back to his cupboard, carelessly tossing him onto the meager bed that scarcely cushioned the hard floor beneath. Vernon's voice, laden with irritation, broke the silence. Useless boy, always causing trouble, he grumbled, as they slammed the cupboard door shut, engulfing the unconscious Harry in solitude and darkness once more. Their conversation soon turned to the possibility of sending Harry away to an orphanage, a thought that had crossed their minds before but had been dismissed due to fear of attracting the attention of the freaks, as they referred to the wizarding world. Perhaps we should reconsider the orphanage, Vernon pondered aloud, his tone reflecting a mixture of frustration and calculation. He's becoming more of a burden than he's worth. Petunia, her eyes scanning the street through the curtains, weighed in with her own concerns. But what if those people come back asking for him? We can't have them snooping around, she fretted, the possibility of the wizarding world's interference a constant shadow over their decision-making. Vernon's response was pragmatic, yet it carried an undertone of resignation. We'll keep him for now. As long as they don't show up for a couple more years, we will send him away. We tell the freaks he ran off or something. We can't risk getting caught, he concluded, setting the matter aside for the moment. Meanwhile, Harry lay unconscious in the confines of his cupboard, unaware of the bleak plans being discussed just beyond its thin wooden door. His small, battered form was a testament to a young life marked by neglect and absence of affection a life thrust upon him without choice defined by the absence of warmth and the presence of hardship. In the dim, suffocating space of the cupboard, Harry's silent form bore witness to a reality far removed from any child's deserved innocence and care. Chapter 24, The Turn of Fate The darkness of night had settled over the unassuming suburban neighborhood of Privet Drive. Inside number four, the routine hum of an ordinary household masked the unfolding crisis in a small, cramped cupboard under the stairs. Harry Potter, a boy whose life had been marked by neglect and hardship, lay hidden and forgotten, his body fighting a battle for survival. The Disley family did not notice the absence of Harry much. They had grown accustomed to his silence, his ability to fade into the background. In the living room, the television blared, casting flickering shadows across the walls. Dudley sprawled on the couch and was engrossed in a cartoon, his laughter echoing through the house. Petunia, sitting with a magazine, suddenly realized Harry hadn't emerged from his cupboard to cook their dinner. Concerned more about the disruption to her routine than Harry's well-being, she went to check on him. Petunia's steps echoed as she made her way to the cupboard. Time to get up, boy. You've lazed around enough, she called out, expecting the usual prompt response. But silence greeted her, an unusual and unsettling response from the usually obedient Harry. She opened the cupboard door and tugged at Harry's arm, expecting him to wake up. Instead, his body slumped forward, limp and unresponsive. A surge of panic rushed through Petunia as she felt the feverish heat emanating from his skin. Vernon, come here. Hurry. Her voice, usually sharp and commanding, wavered with fear. Vernon Disley, his face flushed from dinner, hurried over. What's the matter now? He asked, annoyance lacing his words. He peered into the cupboard, 
his expression morphing from irritation to concern at the sight of Harry's lifeless body. Petunia gestured towards Harry's limp form and her voice trembled as she spoke. Something's wrong with him. He's burning up and won't wake up. Should we, should we take him to the hospital? Vernon hesitated, his mind racing through the implications. No, we can't. The hospital will ask too many questions. They'll see he's thin and underfed. We'll be in trouble. His voice hardened as he made his decision. Just give him some medicine and put him back to bed. He usually gets better in a few days. Petunia's worry and fear of repercussions were evident. But what if it's something serious? Should we call those people from Lily's world? I don't want him to die here and cause us more trouble. Vernon's face darkened at the mention of the wizarding world. No, absolutely not. I don't want those freaks in our house. If he dies, it's not our fault. He's their kind, after all. That driver should have taken him to the hospital. Just forget about the boy and make some dinner. I'm starving. Reluctantly, Petunia dragged Harry back to his cupboard, placing him on his thin mattress, her conscience uneasy. She covered him with an old blanket, her hands shaking. Guilt nodded at her, but fear of the consequences held her back from seeking help. As they returned to the living room, Vernon grumbled about his disrupted evening. See. I told you. He's more trouble than he's worth. I'm sick of having him in our lives. Petunia sat down, her magazine forgotten. We could, we could leave him at an orphanage. Let them worry about treating him. She suggested hesitantly. Vernon considered it for a moment. I'll think about it. For now, let's just get on with our lives. If he dies tonight, we'll bury him and say he died after that car hit him. No one needs to know. The house soon returned to its usual state, with the sound of the TV and Dudley's laughter filling the air. Harry, alone in the darkness, was forgotten. As the night deepened, Harry's condition worsened. The car accident had caused a fractured rib and internal bleeding. His life hung by a thread. Harry's magic, which had been silently working to keep him alive despite the neglect, was now struggling against the severity of his injuries. Harry's magic had always been there, healing bruises and countering malnutrition, but the current situation was beyond its limited capabilities. In the cupboard, Harry lay still, his body racked with pain and fever. His injuries were severe, and without proper medical attention, his life hung in the balance. Realizing the gravity of Harry's condition, his magic began searching for a solution. His magic, already weakened by the various charms and blocks placed on him, fought desperately to keep him alive. Meanwhile, at Hogwarts, Dumbledore's magical monitoring devices were sounding alarms, indicating something was amiss with Harry. Unfortunately, Dumbledore was away, attending an important meeting at the International Confederation of Wizards, ICW, and the message couldn't reach him. The portraits of previous headmasters and headmistresses whispered urgently among themselves and attempted to contact Dumbledore but to no avail. At the Potter's new home, Lily felt an unexplainable sense of dread but calmed herself after checking on Charles and seeing him sleeping peacefully. Sirius Black, Harry's godfather, also woke up with a bad feeling. He thought of Harry but since there was no way for him to check on Harry, he reassured himself by thinking that Dumbledore would know if Harry was in danger and would ensure his safety. Just when all seemed lost, Harry's magic came to the rescue again. Unable to break the magic block on its own, it focused on dismantling the charm that prevented other wizards from finding Harry. After a fierce struggle, the specific charm shattered, along with the last of Harry's available magic. With the charm gone, in a few seconds, a small elf named Myra popped into Harry's cupboard. Myra, the Potter family's and Harry's personal house elf, had been searching for Harry ever since she lost the connection to her bond with him. She had heard from the Hogwarts elves that Dumbledore had taken Harry away that night, and she had been trying to find him ever since. Seeing Harry's almost unrecognizable form, Myra knew she had to act fast. Harry was in critical condition, and his life at the Disleys was clearly filled with abuse and neglect. Anger and sorrow welled up in her as she realized the extent of Harry's suffering, but she knew saving Harry was her priority. Thinking quickly, Myra took Harry's limp hand. With a determined look fueled by her loyalty and love for the boy she had cared for and who cared for her, she popped away to an unknown location, hoping to find the help Harry desperately needed to save his life. The quiet of the cupboard under the stairs at number 4, Privet Drive, was left behind as Myra and Harry disappeared into the night, the first step in changing the course of Harry's fate. Chapter 25, The Healer's Sanctuary Nestled in the serene mountains of northern England, 
hidden from the prying eyes of the world, lay a quaint and enchanting cottage. This haven, surrounded by a lush garden of rare and mystical plants, was the sanctuary of Healer Folly, an old healer whose name was whispered with reverence in the wizarding world. The cottage, with its greenhouses filled with unusual flora, was a treasure trove of knowledge and healing. Inside, the old woman stirred a large pot, her back to the door. From behind, she might remind one of an evil witch from a fairy tale, but her demeanor was that of a kind, wise grandmother. Cordelia Folly, known for her intelligence and kindness, was a healer of great renown. Her untamed auburn curls and twinkling eyes spoke of a life filled with both joy and profound knowledge. Dressed in deep purple robes, with a wand tucked neatly behind her ear, she exuded an air of mystery and wisdom. As she focused on her potion, the wards around her cottage chimed softly, signaling the arrival of unexpected visitors. Stepping outside, she was met with a sight that pierced her heart a house elf, cradling a gravely injured young wizard. Mistress Folly, healer of many, please help Master Harry. He is dying. Myra can't do anything to save Master Harry, Myra pleaded in her unique elf speak, her voice laden with tears. Cordelia's gaze softened as she assessed the boy's critical condition. With a gentle wave of her wand, she levitated Harry into her cottage, into a room that served as her sanctuary of healing a space where magic and medicine intertwined. The room, bathed in soft, soothing light, was equipped with an array of magical instruments and devices, each serving a unique purpose in the art of healing. Here, Cordelia had spent countless hours mending wounds both physical and magical, her skills a beacon of hope to those in dire need. As she placed Harry on the operating table, her expert gaze quickly identified the numerous afflictions plaguing him. She detected traces of dark magic trackers embedded in his skin, and a charm dampening his memories. Her anger grew as she noted Harry's severe malnutrition, the recent serious injuries in his chest, and signs of prolonged abuse. The magical block on his core, and this core powering distant wards, was the final straw. To Cordelia, the extent of Harry's suffering was unthinkable, especially for a child so young. Her heart ached at the sight of such cruelty inflicted upon a child, and her resolve to heal him strengthened. Cordelia worked tirelessly, her hands moving with precision and care. She removed the trackers, ensuring that whoever had placed them would no longer be able to locate Harry. Her spells gently mended his broken bones, healed his bruises, and nourished his malnourished body. The ward connection to his magical core was severed, but she dared not remove the magic block on his entirely, fearing the sudden release of magic might overwhelm his fragile state. As Harry's breathing steadied and color returned to his cheeks, Cordelia finally lifted the memory-dampening charm, curious about its purpose but mindful of the delicate balance she needed to maintain in his recovery. Turning to Myra, Cordelia sought answers. Myra, still trembling but grateful for Harry's salvation, recounted Harry's story, revealing his identity, and the changes in his life after Voldemort's attack. How Dumbledore had orchestrated his separation from his family, and how she, bound by her love and loyalty for Harry, had searched tirelessly for him. So, he is Euphemia's grandson. I remember seeing him years ago, Cordelia mused her mind whirling with the implications. This must be another one of Dumbledore's plans. Always for the greater good, but at what cost? How low has Dumbledore stooped to use a child in his plans? Turning to Myra, she spoke gravely, if we are to protect Harry from further manipulation, we must make Dumbledore believe he is dead. It will require deception and secrecy. Are you prepared for this? Myra nodded resolutely, for Master Harry, I will do anything. Cordelia outlined her plan. It involved continuing Harry's treatment and creating a decoy to fool Dumbledore. She cautioned Myra about the costs, both monetary and magical. Myra, undeterred, assured her that she could access Harry's trust vault and it should be able to cover the cost. She returned momentarily with a sack of galleons, enough to cover the expenses of their elaborate ruse. With the resources at hand, Cordelia set to work. Cordelia used many rare magical items to craft a golem, a magical replica of Harry, imbued with just enough magic to withstand scrutiny. She then instructed Myra to take her to the location where she found Harry. Under the cover of night, she and Myra ventured to Privet Drive. They first placed the golem Harry in the cupboard under the stairs. Cordelia then manipulated the Disleys, magically compelling them to bury the golem in a place that they themselves would be unable to find later. This would stop Dumbledore from getting his hands on Harry's body. Magic would take care of the specifics, and the Disleys would find the burial place in a remote confusing place. Cordelia and Myra then watched as Vernon and Petunia Disley followed Cordelia's instructions. 
she helped them by meticulously covering their tracks, ensuring they remembered the events as she planned and Dumbledore could not follow the tracks to the golem. As they departed Privet Drive, Cordelia ensured that any magical traces were erased, her spells leaving no stone unturned. She needed to be extra careful to have a chance at fooling Dumbledore. Cordelia's final act was to destroy the protective wards around Disley's house, making it appear as a consequence of Harry's supposed demise. Back in the tranquility of her cottage, Cordelia reflected on the night's events. She had chosen not to inflict harm upon the Disleys, despite their cruelty to Harry. Her principles as a healer and a protector of life guided her actions, even in the face of such blatant injustice. Myra, we must allow Harry time to recover fully before we consider any form of retribution against those who have wronged him, Cordelia advised the house elf, her voice carrying the weight of experience and wisdom. Our priority is his well-being and safety. Myra, her loyalty unwavering, agreed. She understood the importance of patience and the need to focus on Harry's recovery. In the quiet of the night, the cottage became a sanctuary for Harry. Here, he would find the care and compassion he had been denied for so long. Cordelia watched over him, her mind already planning the next steps of his treatment and recovery. The magical block on his core remained a concern, but she was determined to address it when Harry's body was healed and stronger. As dawn approached, bringing with it the promise of a new day, Harry lay in peaceful slumber, unaware of the lengths to which Cordelia and Myra had gone to save him. The old healer stood by the window, gazing out at the awakening world, her thoughts a blend of concern and determination. She had known the boy for only a night but vaguely knowing what he had gone through, she felt it was her duty to help him. She knew from examining his magic core and the history of the Potter family that the boy was destined to become a strong wizard. At that moment, Cordelia Folly made a silent vow. She would be the guardian, the mentor, and the healer that Harry needed. She would shield him from the machinations of those who sought to use him and help him grow into the wizard he was destined to be. As the first rays of sunlight pierced the horizon, casting a warm glow over the mountains, the cottage stood as a beacon of hope. Within its walls, a young wizard's journey to healing and recovery had just begun, under the watchful eye of one of the wizarding world's most skilled healers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>